call to order this meeting of the Waterbury Select Board on Monday, the second, no, the third of June. Uh, first item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda as presented with the addition of approving um, a liquor license for Blackback for Music in the Alley um, after the 710 public event item. Second. Considering or approving? For the purposes of the agenda, putting black back liquor license music in the alley after 710 public. Do you accept the uh, friendly amendment? Yep. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? I all right. I abstain. Hmm? I abstain because I'm on the Rotary Board and they have the entertainment permit. Mm -hmm. so. Oh, okay. Well, um, you can still approve the agenda. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay. well, right, because this is not the consent agenda. Uh, the agenda is I approved, approved as amended uh, with one abstention. Now it's approved unanimously. Um, next is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That all those things because I'm on the board of the Rotary who's applying for the entertainment permit. The consent agenda passes uh, with four yeas and one abstention. Okay, uh, next we have the uh, public session. Anyone wishing to address anything not on the warned agenda, uh, please come forward. Uh, I ask you to try to keep yourself to three minutes. Anything requiring more discussion, we'll be glad to put it on the agenda for an ensuing meeting. Okay. That's the first this, this year. We are moving like <laughs> wildfires. Let's go. Um, <laughs> Manifesting. <laughs> Chris Yens is in here. <laughs> Good point. Sure. Um, Next on the agenda is the. So, um, mm -hmm. so do we want to raise the issue um, about the roundabout? No, we were going to talk about that in two weeks. Uh huh. Okay. Great. Perfect. Moving forward. Yeah. The public will right. remain on tender hooks about the <laughs> concern about the roundabout. Um, okay. Next on the agenda, uh, we have a. Uh, application the by addition, Roger, the, the hmm? addition, yep. my addition for black liquor license. What? That's what I'm talking about. Yep. Oh, sorry. The uh, <laughs> liquor license application for music in the alley from a black back. Uh, they are asking uh, for an event to be approved. I think it's three events. Yeah. Three events. Yes, three events. June 21st, July 19th, and August 23rd. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the license, uh, license to serve liquor outdoors for Blackbacks three events on June 21st, July 19th, and August 23rd. I'll second. Move and second. Discussion. <coughs> Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Black Pack has its permit. Okay, next on the agenda is consider the appointment of the Conservation Commission, Angela Kilsman. Is Angela here? I don't think so. She's. Um, I don't see her online. I only met her once briefly. Mm -hmm. And I don't see it here. Amy Marshall Carney, though, is yeah, online. She may be able to speak. Yeah, maybe. Amy. Hi there. She was planning to attend. She does have a toddler with her, so I think she was going to be very calculated about what time she came, so she wasn't disruptive. But the last word I got from her was that she was very much planning to attend in person. Okay. Well, um, we can. I have met with her, so I'm not. You have met with her. I was just going to say that I have met with her. Yeah, and I very much support her um, participation. She uh, has a very strong communications background, 
And I think that um, her affinity towards education and communication will really help round out um, the work that we've got planned going forward. And she has All some right. background with Green Mountain Club and I believe the Vermont Land Trust as well. Here's somebody with a toddler. Ah, there she is. I wonder if that might be Angela Hill. Angela. Hi. 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 Angela, come forward. Sorry. You're already up on the agenda. <laughs> And you can come with your friend as well. My son. Did you sit? You want to sit here? No. Okay. Hi. Can I sit here? Hi. Yes. Absolutely. Well, thank you for applying. And uh, you just received an endorsement from the chair of the uh, Library uh, Conservation Commission. Uh, and uh, maybe you could just give us a bit of background about uh, why you're interested in serving. Yeah, um, well, I've worked for conservation organizations, as I think y'all were just discussing, um, have a huge interest in it, um, and thought it'd be a cool way to pursue my interest and be involved in the community. How long have you been living in Waterbury? Two years now. Mm -hmm. Right. With yeah. my son. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi. Welcome. What's your son's name? This is Micah. Micah. Mm -hmm. uh, any other questions for uh, Angela? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Hello. Hi. 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 Yes, ma <laughs> Just want to ask you, as I asked a lot of the Conservation Commission, what's your opinion of like a balanced approach between conservation and economic development within the town? Yeah, what's my opinion on the balance between economic and, I'm sorry, what was the other piece of that? Right, economic and conservation. Economic, economic and conservation. conservation. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of like <clears throat> the challenge Vermont is having right now, right? Because we need development to bring in more revenue, <laughs> um, but conservation is a big part of that and access to land is kind of like one of our sweet spots and iconic for the state, it attracts a lot of people. Um, so it's definitely an important thing to consider, but um, I feel like there's enough experts in this state that we can find the right balance between the two. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Other questions? Uh, I noticed in your Hmm. Application. Uh, you wrote papers on nitrogen pollution, which is a big Vermont problem. Yeah. I wouldn't say I've written papers, I've written articles about it <laughs> as a journalist. I am no scientist, but um, yeah, I don't know too much about nitrogen pollution. I mean, back up, I know a lot about nitrogen pollution, mm -hmm. but um, as it pertains to Vermont, like I haven't dug into it as much, but I understand. In the um, Lake Champlain, right? Yeah, that's what you're referring to. So I definitely read a little bit about it. Uh, was there like a further yeah, question? Yeah, I'm just asking because <laughs> Vermont prides itself on being an agricultural state. Yeah. <clears throat> Nitrogen pollution usually comes along with agriculture. Right. Yeah. And how so, does that fit into uh, conser conservation efforts? How does that fit into conservation efforts? Um, you guys are really giving me some tricky questions. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a scientist, but so when I was a journalist, I worked um, in an agricultural community in South, on the south coast of Massachusetts. So that's why nitrogen was also nitrogen pollution was also a big problem in the ocean, right? So the farms, a couple of golf. Golf, uh, what do they call it? Fields? Mm -hmm. Golf courses. Golf courses, thank you. <laughs> um, so you have a lot of nitrogen pollution in um, the estuaries and the ocean. So, But I got to write about some pretty cool things. Like they had um, septic systems that filtered out nitrogen pollution, or they were working by like to boost the, the um, shellfish population and test how much that pulls out of the water. So I've learned a lot about it. It'll be interesting to look at what's going on in Waterbury and how nitrogen pollution might be affecting what's here, but definitely have some familiarity with it. Great. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Other question from the board. Anyone else got a doozy that they want to I know. And <laughs> an <Yeah>. audience. <laughs> <laughs> so They're friendly. <laughs> yeah. From uh, <laughs> afar, I want to join in. If not, uh, do I have a motion? 
and say, I forgive my distractedness. I was seeing if we had a term, Karen. Yeah, I, there's a vacancy that ends April 30th, 2026. And I will move to appoint <coughs> Angela Hilsman to the Conservation Commission for the vacant term ending 2026. Mm -hmm. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Angela, congratulations and thank you for your service. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming in. Yeah, yeah. Say bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs> and I'll shamelessly say you might be interested in the next agenda item if you can spare a few more minutes. <laughs> All right. So now on the conservation commission. Yeah. All right. So maybe we should take a break and then we'll come back. Thank you. Next on the agenda is uh, Department of Forest and Parks Recreation and Waterbury Land Initiative about uh, conserving a parcel of land in Waterbury. Who would like to address us first? <coughs> um, but probably, yeah, you want to stick the I'll play the yeah. 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 These two gentlemen's names, I don't. Okay. I'm Gannon Osborne with uh, I'm the Land Conservation Program Manager at the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And Gunnar Nurmi, last name's N-U-R-M-E. I'm the Land Acquisition Coordinator. Do you all have the maps printed out in the packets and stuff? Because I have some more. I don't know if we have Maybe we do. Maybe we do. On the back side right here. Gotcha. Yeah, they should be. Yep. It's all paper clipped together. Yeah. Right there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I'm going to start things off. And your um, name is? Tom. My name is Steve Hagenboo, yeah. and I'm uh, I live on Maple Street in Waterbury Center. Um, I'm a founding board member of the Waterbury Land Initiative, or WLI, as I'll call it from here on out, um, and. Really appreciate the opportunity to come here this evening to share with all of you kind of more broadly about the Waterbury Land Initiative and who we are, and then more specifically about a conservation project that we'll be looking for support from the municipality um, for here this evening. So the Waterbury Land Initiative is, I mean, we're, we're kind of the essence of what I would call really a grassroots nonprofit volunteer organization. Um, we're a group of community members that came together, I think most formally in 2019, now I probably should have confirmed that, but we are a 501c3 nonprofit, and really, kind of basically speaking, our what we're here for is to help interested landowners to, to think about the long-term protection of land that they may own, uh, to keep it as open space, whether that be for agriculture, for forest management, for wildlife habitat, for recreation, or any of the other values that, that people hold for their land. And one of the things that we really identified kind of as a niche for, for the Waterbury and Land Initiative is that while we do have land trusts, formalized land trusts in Vermont, groups like the Vermont Land Trust and more locally the Stowe Land Trust that might hold conservation easements on properties or own land outright, um, a lot of the times, particularly on smaller parcels, the, that project may not fit the kind of the goals and strategic priorities of some of the larger land trusts. And so we saw an opportunity and a need, quite frankly, for some landowners that don't fit the, the interest of those larger land trusts to try to help to facilitate and think about ways for them to achieve their goals and objectives, which is to, to conserve or to permanently protect that land in, into the future. So with that in mind, um, that kind of takes me into the, this project in particular. Um, and this is the, what we call the Gilpin Conservation Project. It relates to 83 and a quarter acres of land located off Perry Hill Row, uh, Road and uh, Black Bear Hollow. Um, the Gilpin family is, is here both in person and, and also via Zoom. So three siblings, uh, Beth Gilpin who is here and then Linda Gilpin and Rob, who I believe are both joining us via Zoom. Um, a number of years ago, Linda came to me and, and said, you know, we've got this, this piece of land that our parents had owned for <coughs> close to 30 years or more. And please correct me if I, if I get any of the specifics <laughs> incorrect. But um, it was a piece of land that their parents owned. Both, both those parents have now passed on. But really their interests um, and desires 
for that land was to keep it as open space into the future. And I'm actually going to, to read um, something that the Gilpins prepared for me to, to kind of show it, it's the specific wishes that their parents had um, for this land. Uh, one is related to something that they call the 50-year covenant. Speaking here, whereas there is a need to subject the property to certain covenants in order to, to conserve the natural environment, preserve and enhance the scenic beauty of the area. And then in a letter that expresses their final wishes um, and providing context to their wills, the letter shared their hope that, quote, we would divide the rest of the land in such a way that some land could be conserved, logging can be possible over the years to keep the woods healthy. Um, and so that, to me, just speaks to a, a family that really has a strong desire to kind of support the long-term wishes um, of their parents by, by finding a way to, to help protect this land and keep it open. After a variety of different conversations and, and kind of coming around to the final configuration of the project, there are two parcels, as you'll see on the map there, um, which total 83.25 acres. The larger parcel is uh, owned commonly by the three siblings, and the smaller parcel <coughs> is owned by Beth, um, specifically. And so we looked at a couple of different options for how to achieve those desires, um, everything from talking to the Vermont Land Trust and the Stowe Land Trust, again, neither of which really this was fitting their priorities. So ultimately, given the location of this property adjacent to the C.C. Putnam State Forest, we did approach the state of Vermont, Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation, to see if this is something that they would be interested in as an addition to the Putnam State Forest. And so here we are today uh, with Gannon and Gunnar to kind of share they, they are interested. Um, we've been working hard to, to see how we can make this all work. Um, and I'll turn it over to, to Gannon and Gunnar to kind of give more specifics on the project. Thank you, Steve. Um, so again, my name is Gannon Osborne. I'm the Land Conservation Program Manager at the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Recreation. I'm joined here tonight by Gunnar Nermi. I'm the Land Acquisition Coordinator with the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks, and Rec. Yeah, and I uh, just wanted to first say a huge thank you to the Gilpin family for their conservation ethic and vision for this land and for the property and the, the careful stewardship of the land over the years and also to the Waterbury Land Initiative. Um, Steve just described the process in a, a few sentences there. That process has taken uh, four or five years now. It's uh, a lot of emails back and forth, a bunch of meetings, a couple site visits. So uh, really, really appreciate all the hard work that the Waterbury Land Initiative has put in to, uh, to get this conservation effort to where it is today and for us to be able to present it to you tonight. Um, so as Steve mentioned, we are pursuing uh, the acquisition of two parcels totaling 83 acres uh, as an addition to the Perry Hill block of C.C. Putnam State Forest, um, as well as a purchase of one right-of-way that currently crosses C.C. Putnam State Forest that the Gilpins also own. Uh, so we're, we're combining those two aspects into one conservation project here. Um, the acquisition would add to the Perry Hill block uh, of C.C. Putnam State Forest, protect additional forest land, expand uh, public access opportunities, and also improve access to the state forest for management um, for our, our land management staff. Um, yeah, for, so for all of our conservation projects, we offer to present the, uh, the project to the local select board in which the project is taking place. And we also ask for the local select board support for every acquisition uh, of an interest of land that a and uh, moves forward with. Um, in this instance, we are also going for, uh, we're pursuing some grant opportunities. One, a federal grant through the land, Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund, and also a state grant from the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board. And uh, BHCB specifically asked to see local support for, their pro for the, the projects they fund as well. So we're here tonight to, to present the opportunity to you to uh, discuss this conservation project and also to ask for your support as we move forward uh, with the conservation project and with receiving state grants to fund uh, what we hope to be an acquisi FPR acquisition of, of these two parcels and the right of what. Um, you mentioned uh, 
interest in uh, managing the forest. Uh, what are the particular uses uh, that the state has in mind for that parcel? So uh, prior to any additional uses being expressed on the land, we would need to go through a public planning process, which you might be familiar with. We've been going through for the rest of CC Putnam State Forest and the Worcester Range Management Unit, um, a, a public long range management planning process. This parcel prior to any additional forest management, any uh, recreational infrastructure development would need to go through a similar public planning process to be uh, amended into the Worcester Range Management Unit Plan. Um, up until the time that that takes place, the parcel will be managed for its current uses, uh, which is, there really aren't any current <laughs> uses out there. So that's, that's a policy of FBR to honor existing uses, but not to expand beyond what is currently out there. So it would be open to the public for uh, dispersed public recreation, like you could walk out on the property, take a hike out there, go hunting. Um, but beyond that, we would manage for maybe some invasive species management, or if there were any uh, serious wind event up there, but other than that, the property would just be held until it went through that public planning process. <coughs> there are a couple of mountain bike trails up in that neighborhood. There are a few. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering if there are, if it's already being used for mountain biking, would it expand to uh, the mountain biking in the CC Putnam Forest? Uh, what, what's your thinking around that? So to my knowledge, there are currently no trails, mountain bike trails, on these parcels in particular. Um, and any development of mountain bike trails would need to go through that public planning process and would be considered against uh, through that public planning process and also uh, in consideration of the other recreational, scenic, ecological, forest values that are uh, that come to light through the assessments as part of that process. Okay. And I got one more question. Then others. Uh, I'm noticing on the map that there's one little piece that has road frontage on Perry Hill Road, and you mentioned that uh, this would increase uh, access for forest management. And I'm wondering to what extent are you expecting more traffic to access uh, that block? through that uh, road frontage? Uh, I do not anticipate traffic through that road frontage. So that, it does have road frontage on Perry Hill Road. As you can see there, it's, it's rather constrained. Uh, I, we, when we went out to look at the property, I remember standing across from one of our foresters and we were, it's maybe down to like 20 feet. And there's, it's pretty ledgy and steep there. And so, um, at the time, given our assessment, we did not feel that any vehicular access was feasible there. Um, but the lots three and five that we would be purchasing there uh, are benefited from a right of way that travels along Black Bear Hollow Road. Um, so there is an alternative access to those parcels. Uh, one of the challenges we have with managing the Perry Hill block is that you have to go over uh, uh, over the railroads and under the interstate to get to mm -hmm. to get to the block. And so we really have restricted access to get any vehicles uh, onto the property itself. So these parcels would allow for uh, legal vehicular access from that right of way up Black Bear Hollow Road. Um, again, any future management activities on the parcels would need to be considered through that long range management planning process. So no future management envisioned at this time. All right, other questions? Roger stole my thunder a bit. And <laughs> I met, met with, at the Conservation Commission with you guys, so that answered a lot of my questions. But the one thing I know I've been hearing some public <laughs> issues about the potential expansion of mountain bike trails into those two um, parcels. Is there in your, I know you have a planning process, but I'm sure in your acquisition, you have some sort of a long range plan for this, this parcel. 
are you looking at it being for specifically I know adjacent to it is a lot of mountain bike recreation but are you looking f for additional mountain bike trails on those specific two parcels or are you looking at just an extension of the Putnam Forest and forestry and other kind of you know activities it's a good question uh, so <laughs> I've been around in this position long enough now to know not to look for specific uses in our land acquisition projects and our conservation projects. Right. Uh, this, these parcels meet our general overall values. They protect additional forest land. They would expand public access at an existing uh, public land unit. They, uh, they would protect the opportunity for trail development in the future if that was in line with the community's interests and with what the, the resources out there could support. Um, but at this time, until we go through that planning process, we really cannot say for certain whether there would ever be trails developed out here or not. And so I've, I've learned not to, not to say one way or the so other. So you haven't purchased it with the express desire? No, 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 really, uh, when we look at conservation opportunities, um, the first folks this goes to are our land, manage land management staff, a group of uh, our district stewardship team, so a group of wildlife biologists, foresters, wetland specialists, recreation specialists, who take a look at all the broad values of the property, um, forest health, uh, recreational potential, scenic values, and if that meets the high level of ANR's uh, conservation values, then we move forward from there. And that, that's what this means. It meets those, those higher values, and we don't get into the details of management until that public process. King. Was uh, the Department of <clears throat> Forests interested in these plots before you were approached? I am not aware of any conversations prior to this um, about pursuing this. Uh, I will say it does rank highly on Vermont Conservation Design, which is the conservation tool that we rely on as a state to uh, prioritize and review conservation opportunities. It's considered the highest priority for conservation from a landscape scale. It has a highest priority forest block, part of a highest priority forest block. Um, so it does rank highly on what we review our, con the tool that we use to review our conservation opportunities. Um, but we also have so many conservation opportunities going around, on around the state that we often struggle to be uh, proactive in our efforts. And um, that's an unfortunate reality of, of there being two of us for the entire state, but uh, that's kind of how it works. So when Steve approached us um, with this opportunity, we ran it through that process, that review process, the Vermont Conservation Design Tool, and came to the decision that yes, this is some, a conservation opportunity we'd be interested in. <coughs> Other questions? Uh, I, I have a, a few. Um, so the, within the town, there's a, there's a utility district which owns several hundred acres of a sweet road, mostly in stow, but um, it's a watershed protection area. It has many, many miles of mountain bike trails, none of which have been approved. Um, and we have begun to struggle with it, and we have concerns over the drinking water supply. Um, similar stories, my understanding is the trails below this parcel were developed unpermitted. Um, and over time, essentially, predates me, but essentially what I've been told is the state sort of acknowledged that these were here to stay. Um, so, in the same way, we, our utilities have struggled to stop the development of new trails. Um, it appears likely that trails will be built here if they're not already. Um, so, what do you do to stop that if that's not the desire? And then what? And then the other concern I would have, um, more specific concern, is what if there are neighbors that don't want that, and they suddenly, you know, it may not be on their property, but they're impacted. You know, they're in a pretty rural area and they suddenly, it's a, you know, they're impacted by the usage. I mean, I drove the, I drove the river road today um, twice in the middle of the day. Granted, it was a nice day, but there were 
10, 15 cars there at 10 a.m. in the parking lot and a similar number at two o'clock and there's probably a lot more now. Um, so my concern especially is, um, I feel like there should be a process to engage with the adjoining property owners. In the same way, if you were, if you were building a house in Waterbury, you notify via letters. You have their chance to give some public input to the Development Review Board. And I feel like that's one concern um, because I think the town tends to wind up managing those challenges as time goes by. Um, the other concern I have, um, which I think is really serious, is um, we're deeply struggling to maintain our gravel roads already. And so I feel like from our perspective, I would really love to see a hard no on any sort of parking lot put in because that's a, you know, we spent 90 grand on mud season. You're talking about the Perry Hill? Off of Perry Hill. I feel like there's a, there's a parking lot on the bottom. Um, Perry Hill is one of our, we're getting traffic counts this year, but I, would, I'm, I believe it's one of our heaviest travel gravel roads. Um, you know, we, we um, I suspect during my tenure we may, be, we may be forced to pave that, and that's not a small proposition financially. Um, so if we can delay that, that's important. Um, the other comment I want to make, and this is important, and this is not your issue, but it's, it's a town select board issue. We approach forests and parks and spend a lot of time working on um, a chunk of land next to the parking lot um, for the Hunger Mountain Trailhead, the old quarry. And in our judgment, there's something like 10,000 yards of stone we could crush and we propose that if the state would let us do it, we'd be in and out as quick as we could and we'd leave them a, a level parking lot. Um, you know, it's a few acres. Um, Pretty hard no. Um, you know, I don't think the select board should use adding more land to the state parcel as a bargaining chip per se. But at the same time, it, it, it feels not on your part, but and I know state government is big and people, this is a you know, it's a disjointed piece sometimes, and, and I'm not saying there's some Machiavellian scheme, but I'm saying from our perspective, um, you know. No one wants to be the person who opposes land being put into conservation permanently. Um, but I feel like some give and take with the state over that other parcel is really in order. I mean, 10,000 yards of gravel, we're driving down to South Barry, um, 25 miles, um, three miles a gallon empty, two miles a gallon, maybe one and a half mile gallon full truck. Um, it's an awful lot of uh, wear and tear and money. It's an awful lot of carbon in the air. And so I, I feel like I would have loved it if maybe there was a bigger plan to talk about state land in Waterbury. Um, I guess the what I'll end with is when I started, um, people used to say to me often when I started that um, we had the burden of state government being in Waterbury, both in terms of the complex and in, and in the, the state land. And I, I never understood that. It took me a while because I always thought of the state complex as a as a positive. Um, but I see the viewpoint a little more now. Um, you know, from one perspective, okay, there's there's 83 acres currently preserved. From another perspective, um, you know, if you put two houses on it um, and preserve the rest, there's a lot of tax revenue for the town. You don't have neighbor conflicts that would otherwise occur if there were trails. And you don't have the road use issues. Um, so I feel like this is a really interesting proposal, but I don't feel like it's quite a slam dunk. I feel like there's gonna be some impact on the town here that um, mm -hmm. I'd like to think about and talk about a little more. Yeah, Alyssa. Um, I guess I would say, I hear you, Tom, in some ways, I think, if anything, that argues for a comprehensive planning process on the part of the state, if the town is really heavily interested in doing a thing, and the state of Vermont was still able to say, no, that doesn't make sense here, just to speak to the fact that I think we're all acknowledging that this isn't fully thought out. I guess I would say we had a really long conversation about regulations and zoning at our last meeting, and we came down on the side of private property owners being able to have the most flexibility to do what they would like to do with their land, and I just want to acknowledge the Gilpin family and desired wishes around conservation. I think 
we have complicated questions, and I don't mean to minimize any of that, but the fact that it's literally adjoining state land, um, I'm not a conservation expert, but to me it, it is a different type of proposition, um, recognizing that the state of Vermont, for all its complexities, is asking us if we would let them go out and find money to make this a reality. And yes, two homes would be easier and maybe more money on the tax roll as someone who lives on a 0.02 acre parcel in downtown, having accessible state land is something that I value. I'm not a mountain biker. I don't think it has to be about uses. Um, so I guess I just would say like, I wouldn't want to presuppose anything um, because there is inconveniences. And again, I don't want to be starry-eyed or not think about those, but I want to acknowledge the work that went into this. Um, I'll also say for public record, I was on the WLI board. I started collaborating them, with them when I was the economic development director, recognizing that um, economic development and conservation can go together. I joined as a full board member for two years. I'm no longer on the board, so I don't have a real or perceived conflict of interest, but just would acknowledge a lot of work and planning has gone into this proposal. Um, and I just personally don't think the state of Vermont does things lightly. <laughs> I think for I think for other projects we're working on, they um, we have professionals, we have a rigorous process. So again, I don't want to minimize that. I think there are real concerns, and um, we can talk about this. But I don't. They don't strike me as someone who's going out on a whim um, on something they haven't done before. Can I just respond? I think your questions, Tom, are, your points are very well taken. And uh, on the first one about. Um, contacting the, the abutters to the land. That is something that Beth and I uh, did do, but either in person or via okay. phone calls. Uh, we didn't get to every single person, but we hit a majority of the, of the abutters to that land. And I would say that the response um, was either, well, it's your land, you can do what you want, or it was an enthusiastic, yeah. it'd be great to, to see that. Yeah, um, so we did, we were very intentional about making sure that we let folks know what we were planning ahead of time. Um, I'll, I'll also just say that prior to any trail development there, there would be a public planning process that we would welcome those neighbors to provide input into. So there would be uh, an avenue for that uh, input as well. I guess my point is, is you know, in our waterworks, it's not a hundred people developing trails; it's two or three. But when they're there, they're used. Yeah. Yep. And unless we decide to station someone up there twenty four seven, you really can't stop someone with a shovel, right? And that's yeah. what what uh, is somewhat unique about state ownership is that we do have stewardship and management staff who do get out to these properties, especially an accessible publicly used property like the Perry Hill block as much as possible. Um, we, we recently came across a rogue trail up in Stowe on state land and worked with the local trail community to remove that and decommission that trail. So it is something we experience across the state and that we try to work with the community uh, and we try to work with our local trail partners to try to control and to provide education for folks who are, who are using those trails um, and also to, to, when necessary, close down those trails. Um, and so that is that is something we are, we are somewhat unique and, and lucky that we have that staff to perform that management. And I would just say to your point about Perry Hill Road and parking up there, I think, you know, there's a lot of things we can't give solid answers about. I think we can give a pretty firm note about that. Um, our district stewardship staff has been up there, um, and I wasn't there, Gannon was there, but from everything I've, everything I've heard, um, they kind of looked at it and said, you know, no. This yeah, we did, we did take a look at the property to, to think about, okay, is this a place that would, could feasibly uh, support parking in the future? And even uh, from a, could we get a truck up there would we ever want to like put a, a forest road up there or just just a better access and the answer was no um from the start that that was like not something we were even going to consider so uh on, on this property I, I do not envision parking on the prairie hill side um uh in the future and and to your your point about the the gravel um on cc putnam um i was not a part of that uh, review, but I know our district stewardship team spent a lot of time reviewing and discussing that. And if you have any outstanding questions, um, we can we can always uh, put you in touch. I know 
Um, the Conservation Commission had some outstanding questions uh, regarding the Western Range Management Unit Plan. Put them into, or I've, I've reached out to some folks and just let them know that. So if you'd like me to put you in touch with anybody from our district stewardship team, I'm more than willing to, to get them at your next meeting or just put you in touch with them. No, I think we would appreciate that. Um, it's, a, it's an ongoing concern uh, the trailhead uh, for Hunger Mountain, which is one of the more heavily used trails in the state is consistently uh, overfilled on the weekends. Uh, people park on the street, there are concerns about access. Uh, one of the neighboring property owners uh, complains frequently about people parking uh, on his side of the street. And you know, from our standpoint, uh, this really should be considered, uh, not only because we need the gravel, uh, which people do use in order to access the trailhead, um, but also uh, because uh, we, we see it as a, a potential to expand the parking, which is, you know, it's already attracting people. But it's, it's not, restricting parking is not gonna uh, uh, diminish the amount of people that are using the trail. Uh, well, Beth, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, I just, um, thank you for the discussion. I, I wasn't sure I followed Tom, one of your last comments. I thought I heard you have a concern about potential need to pave something on Perry Hill or Black Bear Hollow. Did I? So mm -hmm. it's, um, we're, we're getting a traffic count study done this summer for all our gravel roads, just to try to better prioritize our maintenance. But um, you know, they're all bad. So um, this is on the paved section. That's what I'm just curious. About. No, understand. Oh, okay. but it's all connected, um, and so our, you know, I don't want to promise anything um, or even suggest it at this point. But there's national conversations internally that Perry Hill might be a target that we need to pay because of the growing traffic, and I, and that's that's a multi-million dollar proposition, and I'd hate to, um, I'd hate to have to accelerate that. Hmm. Um, Can I go ahead? I just yep. wanted to give you ask me if I could, you know, weigh in if there was anything that sure. I wanted to add in, and um, just that the parcel, the current use is current use. It's been enrolled in current use for twenty five years. Um, I think that was really it. <laughs> just wanted to address that. Okay, Roger. Hmm? Yeah, Ken. Um, this comment isn't for. The Waterbury Land Initiative or Beth, because honestly, this is a good idea. But <clears throat> more about land that is owned by the state. Uh, when we have a proposition like this, um, and the state jumps at the chance to grab 80, 83, 83 acres. 83.25 acres. 83.25 acres. Um, and we have a very small acre lot downtown. State just can't seem to let go of. Uh, it, it irks me that the state can do you know both things at once, where given an opportunity to eat up 83 acres of Waterbury but won't relinquish two uh, is the problem I have. Right, go ahead, uh, Alyssa. I just characterize the jumping as a five-year process led by local folks who made these connections. Again, the folks at the people of the state. One, there's many things. I'm not disputing your point around other challenges we're having with other entities, but I just want to acknowledge that this was a five-year process to get this to this point. <laughs> so I don't know that it's jumping. And what we're being asked for is permission to apply to more grants so the state has money to pursue this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, over here. Mike Edges. Right. Uh, I just wanted to say that it's been more than five years. Uh, Gilpins came before the Conservation Commission previously. And I'll just say that I'm a former chair of that group and a longtime member. And uh, we looked at it quite favorably, but uh, we didn't have the resources that the WLI has to act on it at all. So uh, even though we like the idea of that being conserved, there was nothing that we could do as a conservation commission. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, Amy Marshall Carney. Your yes. Hello. Yes, uh, you you uh, did respond to uh, this uh, application. Uh, would you mind uh, telling us what you and your commission came up with? 
Sure. Yeah. So we did submit a letter, which I, I know we'll make sure is available on the, the town site for folks to read. But in summary, I think what you've heard here today and uh, Gannon explained that the one of the primary challenges for us as a conservation commission is to assess um, any property uh, or within is to better understand you know, what is the implication that it will have? What effects will it have? Um, whether it's, uh, and I think you listed them, natural communities, you've got the environmental impacts, habitat. And at this point, we have, we only had one page, uh, which was an introductory letter that talked about um, kind of the intent. So our commission felt very strongly that we don't have any material information to assess which made it very difficult to say, well, would we support? And if so, in what capacity? Um, and so I, it felt very broad and it also felt very um, la lacking a lot of details that um, would have implications. And trying to stay in our lane in terms of conservation commission um, with the stewardship of town land that would be owned or and or state land but within the town of Waterbury, again, I can just simply say we didn't feel like we have any information um, to say that it would make sense to do that. So we, we felt like we needed more. And, and unfortunately, as Gannon explained, that the state process, um, we wouldn't expect any of that information until after the acquisition is done. Um, and the other concern, well, I should say concern, but lack of information that we weren't really clear about was, um, so after, if the acquisition were to occur, uh, while there is a planning process, we, we weren't clear um, what what role uh, the town of Waterbury could play in terms of decision making going forward. Mike, I, I want to be totally honest. As much as I'm very much in favor of the conservation aspects of this project, I think they're very admirable. I think. As one, as Tom said, there should be some sort of quid pro quo of, you know, potentially the town getting gravel out of the uh, the sweet road, you know, you know, parking lots. I think that's really important to the town. I think you know we have been stonewalled for a lot of years on that project, and again, where the state's asking for us. To, to approve something as much as I'm, I like the conservation aspects, but I think there should be some sort of, you know, you know, we have needs too. And I think Tom expressed as well. I had a long conversation with Tom about this project too. Um, long term, as much, some of it's been addressed in <coughs> Niels Reinhardt's letter of the 21st. I guess I didn't see it when I attended the original meeting which answered some of my question. I am a little bit concerned of the creep of purchase of public lands in this, in this municipality. We have, if I'm not mistaken, the most state-owned lands in, in, in the state of Vermont in this municip municipality. I know we get pilot program money, but as we all know, that pilot program does not really compensate us for the true cost to run the municipality. You know, they're showing that on the two parcels, you're looking at roughly, you know, $2,600, $2,700 of, of pilot income that would come in. That's significantly probably less than if those properties were in private, private ownership. It's actually equivalent to what you receive right now from the private landowners. Right. The mm -hmm. current pilot payments was revised, the pilot statute was revised in 2015. Um, so right. in this parcel, I believe, is the first acquisition in the town of what would be the first acquisition in the town of Waterbury since that statute was revised. Right. And the current pilot payment for or pilot program <coughs> for any parcels acquired since that time is designed to reimburse the town to make the town whole for any land acquired by the state in that municipality so it's the municipal tax payment is equivalent or the pilot payment is equivalent to what you receive now in municipal taxes from the land. yep yeah i know for in making that estimate Niels um, looked at the 2022 or 2023 tax rates right. for the properties so i agree i'm more concerned about the long term 
mm -hmm. you know, expansion of public lands in our municipality. Where, when does it stop? You know, you know, we do have a lot of public lands already in this municipality. I know this is, yes, I, and I'm very sensitive as being a former chair to the Conservation Commission. I see the conservation aspects of those parcels as being good, but, I, but again, as a select person, I have the, the responsibility to protect the taxpayers of the municipality. And one that, you know, the Hunger Mountain access where we could get gravel, you know, if that was part of the agreement, I think a lot of us could, would be a lot more, you know, you know, favorable. I know you probably can't commit to that, you know, but we may, you know, as a matter of fact, if there is going to be any kind of a thing, I will make an amendment to have that being a contingency of the select board approval. Yeah, I guess uh, I would... Uh, Go ahead and answer, and then we'll uh, recognize them. Okay, I think on uh, on a lot of we take a broader view of the values of public lands and state lands. Um, we think a lot about the ecosystem services that lands provide, the scenic value, the things that make water very beautiful when you step outside and you look around at the the hills that are all protected and that are state lands. So, uh, and and also the. The, the economic values of, of state land. You're mentioning some public recreation pressures, but that is, uh, it is a desirable place to come and to recreate because you have beautiful state lands to enjoy. Um, and those people come downtown after climbing up Mount Hunger. Um, so I think there are a lot of values that having state land in your town also offers. And I, I know there are some challenges that come with that. Um, I, I definitely recognize that. But I think you also need to consider those those benefits also. Thank you. MK. Um, I was just going to say what Ian said in that having the place that Waterbury is, I mean, economically, people come here because we are who we are. And having land conservation, it's part of what we do. And there was a second point, and I can't remember what it was. So. <laughs> I'll see if you're It'll come back. Any other comments on this? Yeah. One, one comment. Um, you know, we've got a family that would like to conserve their land in memory of their parents' values. And now we're linking it to outstanding property between the town of Waterbury and the state of Vermont. I'm not sure that linkage is, is really the right thing to do. I think this should be considered on its merits. This is it a good conservation process? Um, can the town just provide a letter that says, yes, we agree, or we don't agree unless the state does this stuff for us? I mean, it's a, it's a property rights question, I think. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, okay. my second point. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> Does this part of state government have any say in the gravel? I mean, are, like, are we talking to a completely different department? No, that's or the, it's the same, same department. Same department. department. Okay. Different individuals. Yeah. I'll just say yeah. One last thing. Um, I I appreciate that last comment about this is the family's wishes, and I, you know, as an environmental uh, science major in college, I'm. This on on its um, on its face was a very smart, easy decision for me, and I do really appreciate um, also the fact that you know what what are next steps? You know the the public forum and getting public input makes a whole bunch of sense to me, um, and talking directly to you know landowners and budding landowners makes a whole bunch of sense to me. My one question to you guys is you know what is the time frame? If you you know get a letter of support for us, what are what are next steps for you and? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as I, as I mentioned earlier, we are putting together funding applications now. Um, so we are putting in a, a funding application to the Federal Land and Water Conservation Fund and to the Vermont Housing and Conservation Board, if successful here tonight. And then we would move forward with those applications. And if successful with those applications, uh, we likely have funding in hand uh, end of summer, early fall. Um, if we were successful, we'd be talking, we usually ask for one year from uh, time of funding to closing. That gives us enough time to uh, perform our pre-acquisition due diligence, 
survey work, title work, phase one environmental site assessment, um, and prepared documents for closing. Um, so we would be looking at if, again, if this is something you all support, and if we are successful with those funding requests, uh, one year roughly from this summer, so June 2025. Great, thank you. Okay. Uh, Beth. Just a quick question, Shannon. Is there, in terms of the time frames, are there application deadlines that there potential support? Yeah. So we we put in an application to the uh, to the. Vermont Housing Conservation Board, their board will be reviewing that request at their June board meeting on the 21st, I believe. Um, and VHCB has made it uh, a requirement of their funding, if, if they were to fund the project that we have town support. It's also something FPR, as I said, we ask for town support for all of our acquisitions. If the municipality does not support that acquisition, we don't move forward with it. Um, so that's, uh, yeah, so there is, that is the timing around the, the VHCB request. The LWCF request has rolling applications. Um, so we have four opportunities throughout the year to tap into those funds. Uh, I believe there's another one coming up mid-July that we would probably be looking to put in uh, our materials into. I make one last comment. I, I need to move on. I know it's only time. And again, I, I appreciate all the questions and the comments, and particularly sensitive to the one around you know additional tax revenue through potentially having house sites on one or both of these. Parcels. Recording in progress. Thank you. Um, and I guess I would say to that, you know, I think Waterbury is, is looking ahead to, to doing a really good job of thinking about how that housing development. Um, is best situated on the land, you know, kind of more concentrated density in the in the downtown areas. To me, this project actually supports the town plan, the current town plan. Um, it recognizes through Act 179 the, the high priori highest priority uh, interior forest blocks and not fragmenting those blocks and kind of protecting them and, and supporting efforts to maintain them. And this property does fall within one of those highest priority interior forest blocks. Um, so. To that end, it does support the municipal plan that, that the town has towards that end. And specifically, just pulling out the one of the objectives from the natural resources section is to support efforts of private landowners and local, regional, and statewide conservation organizations to protect open space in Waterbury through voluntary programs. Um, so I just want to recognize the, both that the need for more revenue from, from taxes, but also the need to, to protect our, our large forest blocks that we have. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I, I thank you for coming in and presenting this to us. Uh, you know, I'm favorably disposed, uh, but we are, we do need that gravel. And, uh, <laughs> and people do, <coughs> come here and uh, make our downtown a vibrant place and enjoy everything that the library has to offer. But we do need to maintain those gravel roads for them to access it. So if you could manage to uh, get us a <laughs> well, well, like Gannon said, Gannon and I are not in charge of the gravel, um, but we can get you in touch. Yeah, we can. Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I recall when the district stewardship team was talking about that, I don't recall the reasons for why uh, that wasn't pursued but uh i can we can put you in touch with those folks i'm i'm sure whatever reason they gave at the time was a very thoughtful and considered reason and was not made lightly um, we recognize the needs that municipalities have for the lands uh within your boundaries and, rec isn't um, <laughs> and recognize that that state lands are important for many many reasons uh gravel being one but also uh public recreation, ecological values, forestry values. So, so there's a lot of things that we're looking at on state lands. Those are public lands. Um, so I can put you in touch with those people, uh, but again, these are two different decisions that uh, aren't necessarily connected, but. We have been in touch and we've and there's been stonewalling about it. And I'm not blaming you guys. <laughs> it's no pun intended. <laughs> But it, it's it's been it's been an issue that you know we really haven't gotten definitive reasons why 
you, that can be done. Well. Mm -hmm. um, do I have a motion? The motion is to offer a, um, a letter of support for FPR. Um, I will make a motion um, to offer a letter, letter of support um, for the Forest Parks and Recreation for the, um, now, how do I say this, for the passing over of this parcel of land to... Um, there is a, a simple letter on the last page of the packet. Um, it's it's double-sided, so... I have a, that was me conserving right? paper, the way you should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might be too. Supporting the local forest products. Yeah, there we go. Uh, the town of Waterbury right here? Yeah, exactly. Um, you can make a motion to authorize the chair to sign a letter of support. Um, That's in pen. I make a motion to uh, offer the chair to sign the letter of support um, that is in our packet. Second that. Moved and seconded. Further discussion? Mike. I have to make my friendly amendment. Can I, if I can make an amendment, as I said before, I think uh, I'm in total agreement with being support, but I think it should be support that the state will consider our request for taking gravel out of the um, Hunger Mountain Trail uh, parking lot. Sure. <coughs> Uh, do I have a second for the uh, friendly amendment? No second for the friendly amendment? Okay, then we go back to the original uh, motion. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Motion passes. We'll get you our support. Thank you. Look forward to meeting with the folks about the gravel. I was saying, because conditioning a letter is a messy thing I don't want to do. We've made our points. <laughs> Thank you. If you have any additional <laughs> questions, yeah. just feel free to reach Thanks, out. Thank you for all the good It's not personal. I didn't have an opportunity to take a shot. I'm just saying. I get that. Thank you. Okay. Well, that's fine. Um, <laughs> next on the agenda is the uh, hazard mitigation plan. Oh, don't we were in the state for that? They don't know where the fun stuff begins. Um, we have here a Hazard mitigation plan. Oh, yeah. Throw it in the Twenty pages worth. I too lost one. That's a thick one. Oh, here it is. Yeah. Well, I can try to just go online and get one. Um, um, any. Yeah. As a technicality, do we need a motion to open a public hearing or continue a public hearing <coughs> regarding this plan? Uh, yes. Okay. So I move to open or open? Open. I move to open a hearing regarding the Waterbury's 2024 local hazard mitigation plan um, draft as presented in the select board materials for the meeting. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any extensions? All right, and the public hearing has now begun. Um, and we we'll care to provide an update. Uh, anything that we may have changed since the last, uh, since the first public hearing. I think this is the first. This is the first, yeah. Oh, yeah. I thought there was one earlier. And is Keith here? Yes. Okay. Keith. 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 And uh, uh, the main reason we were needing to have a, uh, basically a conversation, really, uh, it's more of an exercise than an actual true public hearing mm -hmm. for this. Uh, FEMA has changed the, uh, basically the way mitigation actions have to be reviewed by communities. Uh, this was as of 2023. The latest updates they uh, 
I'll say, I, I created a little bit of slide deck, but I can kind of follow through real quick. Uh, is this your slide deck? Uh, no, no, that's that's just the draft. Here, I, I'll see. Yeah. Oh, exactly. If you want, or I can bring it. <laughs> if you join the Zoom meeting. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can yeah. 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 You yeah. just got to turn your yeah. sound yeah. all the way down yeah. and oh, yeah. your mic off so we don't explode. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good to hear yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then you just might have to allow it to share screen. Yeah. In case anyone was wondering, my copy is printed on the back of the What the Flood celebration poster. <laughs> <laughs> so, je ne sais quoi. It was never intentional. No, this is the scrap paper collection. We have some steering committee agenda. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We have oh, actually, I'm to the not, good neighbor I'm not going to be able to do that because I don't have my email on this okay. laptop. Oh. Hmm. And I don't even remember my email password. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you don't generally. I can try that. Yeah, as I say, I log in with the computer, not the email. <laughs> I can try. Yeah. You know, it's the modern age of Ooh. having to avoid getting hacked. <laughs> And I'm Keith Kevin, I'm an emergency management planner at uh, CDRPCs. Uh, if you want out. What? Are you screen sharing with Zoom? Oh, I see. Oh, yeah, and as far as the, uh, in 2023, FEMA came out with, uh, actually, no problem. Yeah. She's almost got it. Yeah, 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 you're doing so great. They know my limitations. So <laughs> okay, they know my limitations. Share screen, you totally had it. It was just on the, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. And you can go to the next slide, actually. Next slide. You can just go beep. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, just real quick background for uh, hazards. We've had uh, 29 federally declared disasters in Washington County <coughs> in the last 40 years. Uh, since 2011, it's definitely been picking up the pace. You know, uh, I mean, as we're all aware, you know, after last summer, but I mean, even Waterbury since, since Irene and that, that, that May, actually the uh, May storms of that year uh, were averaging you know, at minimum one uh, and as many as three federally declared disasters per year. Uh, so planning for four of these is obviously ideal rather than waiting until they hit. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide? Uh, does that hazard planning directly affects our towns, especially with the uh, state's ERAF score? Uh, as part of the process of working on your hazard mitigation plan uh, just today, I actually was able to get the confirmation that due to being in the consumer rating system, part of the NFIP and the uh, river corridor bylaws or the uh, uh, restrictions that you've placed through zoning on river corridor, we got the uh, river corridor protect protection just today. Uh, and I'm already, uh, I've been in conversations with the uh, district six garage as far as the road and bridge standards, because from even looking through your uh, select board minutes, it looks, you know, it, it completely appears but you've accepted those. For some reason, there's been a clerical error or something. Uh, so when this LHMP is submitted, it should take your score up to the uh, highest rate in the 17 and a half percent for any future disasters. I'm sorry, can, can you just define the three acronyms you just used for folks at home? Okay, ERAP, sorry. ERAP, nope, nope, NFIB, that's that. yep. and sorry. Yep, thanks. Work with FEMA too much. <laughs> <laughs> I knew what you meant, but just for the, a general audience. The state has the emergency relief and assistance uh, funding program. So FEMA in a uh, federally declared disaster normally reimburses at a 75% ratio than the town it, well, in our state, the state automatically kicks in 7.5%, uh, and then the town would be on the hook for the other 17.5% of any public damages. Uh, now, if you accept the, uh, the latest road and bridge standards, which currently is uh, 2019, have a local emergency management plan, uh, be part of the National Flood Insurance Program, and have a local hazard mitigation plan. That will give you an additional 5%, which um, would take it uh, of 
to 12 and a half percent of the state, of the the state. state. Yeah. yeah from the state uh, and with that river corridor protection that gives you another five percent so it takes it to a 17 and a half percent share from the state in the response to any federally declared disaster so i mean that's a lot of money you know uh, obviously uh, from the regional perspective we want everybody to max out on this uh, you know and it's great for your taxpayers obviously because you're not having to share that that burden uh, so trying to get these pieces uh, lined up you know and especially for the work you it seems that basically the town has already done just trying to make sure you're getting credit for that uh, it's kind of a side piece we're working through while doing this uh, yeah, that's actually, I have to uh, contact District 6 again just because it's been a while. It's been about three weeks. I haven't heard a response back. Uh, they said they were going to look into it. Just need to remind them. Look into what? Uh, whether, because it, from looking through your select board minutes, yeah. it looked like you definitely have passed, the, accepted those. Uh -huh. uh, just making sure they have their copy. And if there is a piece of paperwork where you need to get submitted, just making sure that happens. You know, make sure all the, all the uh, T's are crossed and I's dotted. Uh, okay, so next slide, please. So, yeah, as I was talking about, uh, 2023, uh, FEMA updated some of their requirements. They definitely wanted to address climate change more. Uh, they wanted uh, the town plans, you know, to align with the state's plan, which is kind of, they just put a little more language on that. And they wanted the, about the mitigation actions to be reviewed in a public forum. Uh, with talking with Neil, he, he thought the best method was to come to the select board to review those actions. Uh, and then, uh, next slide. And the, the format for reviewing these is called the, the Stapley. Uh, basically, <laughs> I can't even give you it. It's a social, technical, administrative, political, legal, economic, and environmental. We've kind of boiled this down. i be honest, I found another town that had used a slightly easier framework than that one uh, because the template version that FEMA has is very complicated. It's like everything they do. Uh, but uh, that's it. the uh, mitigation actions I'd shared, uh, and I, I hope you all uh, received a copy. That is in the, the framework that we're using for this, but it's, ba it's basically the same as theirs. It's just a little easier to uh, comprehend. It's just more of a straight answer instead of, theirs actually has multiple steps for each one. Uh, and then if we go to the, I think it's the last slide of this one. And uh, if anyone that is either in the room or is out there, if you haven't seen one of these posters, uh, I'll make sure we share it around as well. The QR code goes to the survey that is also, uh, all the results will be in the uh, hazard mitigation plan. We put them in the end as part of the, one of the steps of the public outreach. So if anyone hasn't completed the survey, please do. Uh, and in the comments are, we put that right in it too. So if somebody feels like leaving a comment, you know, mm -hmm. as long as it's appropriate. <laughs> uh, You're accepting comments until when? We will accept comments until uh, two weeks before the final submission of the plan. You know, we'll, we'll have to close down just to, uh, uh, so theoretically, probably for at least another two, till probably uh, third week of June. This, we're hoping to come back very quickly in July. Uh, I, I've tasked my, our team at CVRPC to, uh, as working on getting the maps. It's often the last step we get done just due to the uh, our workload of our uh, GIS department, uh, but they are currently uh, starting to work on those maps and getting the, the finalized maps for this. Uh, and we'll call out all the vulnerable population sites uh, that we can, you know, daycares, uh, any, basically almost all down street housing, any, anywhere there's a congregate or a school that would be uh, considered a vulnerable location. Uh, if you could bring up the other uh, file that is uh, mitigation actions. This is the main piece. This one? Yeah. Which one am I have now? The bottom? Uh, it'd be the top one. Draft table five. Okay. So that, <laughs> this is, that's directly from the states. Uh, we basically have to align primarily with the state's uh, hazards. Uh, oh, my screen sharing is paused. Fine. 
<laughs> there is uh, one additional one the town had requested was to still have uh, some information about uh, hazardous materials. Green, what are the uh, values represent there? The three cores. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the values on this one, on, uh, on the states, uh, is on a scale of one to four. Four being the highest probability. So it's uh, it's a ranking mechanism that has been developed, you know, through the FEMA process. Uh, to basically, you take the uh, built environment, the people, the economy, and the natural environment. You get an average score and you multiply that by the probability just to try to rank hazards for each town. Mm -hmm. uh, Did you say it's ranked one through four? Yeah, it's oh. yeah, yeah. One a four being that you would expect that to happen okay. in oh, any given okay. year. Uh, yeah. three is a like basically seventy five percent chance uh, on down to one, which is less than ten percent. Uh, there's a hmm. as I say on this one, actually I didn't include the scoring from how they use it. I was just yeah. Put this in we so get we get both see flooding the, and drought. Same <laughs> two types yeah. of flooding on one. And you get, <laughs> yes, yes, we have two different types of flooding, uh, obviously. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't, uh, fluvial erosion generally is more your flash flooding type, mm -hmm. where, you know, obviously you're having true erosion in that. And it's actually the number one uh, financial disaster in Vermont. Uh, fluvial erosion? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, you know, when, when a house falls into a river, mm -hmm. that's fluvial erosion. Mm -hmm. uh, that's fine. Mudslide. Yeah, mudslides sometimes can be. Some we generally usually consider them fluvial erosion uh, rather than landslides. We don't often tra outside of the like last summer. Uh, we don't go to actually a great job of tracking landslides in the state. Uh, I was wondering up the hill. Yeah, as I say, I mean, actually, you had uh, reviewing your data. There's multiple actually in the state park. Uh, mm -hmm. There's quite a few, uh, but we. Yeah, we don't actually track them well here because often it, 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 the true damages often uh, get counted as fluvial erosion because often there's a stream somewhere in relation that is undermined the slope that causes the landslide. So it's kind of a convoluted, complex <laughs> numbers game there when you uh, how they track or in which they choose to track. As, uh, but uh, looking through uh, that one, the main ones. Uh, there's two that actually we kind of, we generally leave off uh, earthquake because there's not much a damage, as I say, not that there isn't a risk of earthquake, but earthquakes are very small and uh, don't cause any structural damage of any kind. And hail, uh, there isn't really, uh, there's no actual public damages to hail in our region that have been recorded. Uh, and it's generally more private, you know, cars, that sort of thing. You know, we're not. You've got to flee the trucks. Yeah, as I say, it, we, we generally don't have the damages, though, that uh, uh, go beyond, you know, like you would see in uh, Midwestern states where they get large enough hail that they actually have to install uh, shatterproof windows, uh, have roofs designed for that. Uh, so if you'd scroll down on this just a little bit, we'll be, actually get into the actual uh, mitigation action. Okay. Yep. Uh, so this uh, th this list is uh, a number of mitigation actions we were able to come up with, uh, both from uh, me and some of my staff working through and looking at the, through uh, uh, issues with the town, uh, and basically the whole point of coming to you is to decide you know because this is your town's plan is. What actions do you want to pursue? Uh, what you know, and what do you want to prioritize as far as those actions? Uh, you know, uh, some of these are already in process. Uh, though anything that's highlighted uh, is basically an activity your town already does, but it also does uh, help mitigate and help uh, track damages and things like that, like updating the road erosion and culvert inventory. Uh, every five years as far as the uh, municipal roads general permit you already have to do that work in the culvert inventory the regional planning commission we ideally we we would like to do it every five years we're realistically on more of about a seven-year cycle uh you know just due to uh staffing issues through covid 
definitely fell behind on those uh, and just actually even having trouble some years getting enough uh, planning texts to come in for the summer to uh, complete those inventories. Uh, but there's a couple others through that, through it, it like the, as far as the uh, municipal roads, general permit, the armoring of the ditches, that's a process you're already doing, but it's, uh, it's a piece, if you want to include it uh, in your mitigation actions, you can get credit for things you're already doing. It doesn't have to be, uh, ideally, you're also going to think of how to expand programs. Uh, there's two culverts that we completely, uh, that we definitely called out specific ones on here that were taken from the uh, state's transportation resiliency planning tool. Uh, so uh, they're, they're undersized and they technically fall to where they are. They're a critical piece. So it, it's on a road generally that if that culvert failed, you would then have trouble getting access to you know, the homes past it. Sure. Uh, one, one is on a sweet road and the other one, I forget the name of the road, but it's up past the uh, the hotel on the other side of the interstate. Plus Plus show. Show. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Uh, Didn't we just do that, or is that pending? This big culvert on the by Missy Hollow there. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. A, you know, right. and that's we you know if it's something that you know we called out and. We just weren't able to verify with the town staff. We can mm -hmm. definitely change that, and you know, and if there's any that we missed that somebody feels needs put in, mm -hmm. and uh, the LHMP is a, uh, uh, it, it's a document that at any time you can add some, a mitigation action to it. So if if there's something that uh, down the road the town decides, you know, we'd really like to pursue FEMA funding for. Uh, say a culvert or or anything you know it doesn't matter what it is as long as that's the, especially if that's the funding source you're going for mm -hmm. uh all it takes is you the select board having a meeting you know vote on that add it to the uh lhmp and you know that does help increase the scoring when at their end if it's a competitive uh scored uh, grant application, mm -hmm. it will increase that scoring of, uh, of saying, you know, it's a listed mitigation action from our LHMP. Cool. Uh, yes. Alyssa. Just when you say categories, you mean like we need one action under local claims and regulations, one under structured infrastructure. Yeah. Am I reading that or one under each type of disaster? Uh, one under each type of disaster. Okay, which could be from any of the above. Yes, categories. yeah, and some of those, some of those actions could possibly cover more than one because often, you know, uh, you're your pieces, especially doing with uh, 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 critical going infrastructure, and especially thinking about uh, uh, power outages. If it's handling power outages, which generally covers like wind, that can cover wind, snow, you know, because uh, your power outages realistically can come from multiple different things. And a lot of these can cover, you know, multiple pieces. So it, it, that piece actually isn't that hard to make sure you have the entire, you know, one action for each piece. Right. It's more uh, making sure you're thinking about what are the things you want to prevent, you know, or try to mitigate in your town. Uh, you know, I know uh, with helping Tom, we, and it, it's listed, uh, we haven't got a final answer yet on the brick application. We yeah. had, and- oh, That was coming to mind. Yeah, we had applied, yes, for a uh, building resilience, <coughs> resilient infrastructures and communities uh, grant to uh, do a stormwater master plan study to develop at, uh, multiple projects, hopefully, uh, from that throughout the town. Is that when that figures into this? Or? Yes, yes. Yeah, before, uh, by the time, by the time FEMA is reviewing the BRCA applications, we, we, uh, that would require having the LHMP in for them to then uh, be able to give the funding to them. Anything else we need to go? No. Uh, uh, as I say, I mean, you all have a copy if you want to just shit, kind of scroll through it. So I guess. Are these ones in this document yeah. that I posted yeah. online? They are. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just wanted to double check it. Wasn't yeah, no, I know. I appreciate that. Can I get the page number? With the highlights, Keith, what's our what's the timeline for finalizing the process? Uh, I would like to have this completed very early next month. You know, uh, like I said, I, I have our uh, mapping people starts in twenty five working on this. So basically, uh, 
we get this piece done, it'll take me about two weeks to wrap that, wrap up the entire plan, put in any edits, um, load in the survey, and the, uh, uh, and we'll have to finish up with the uh, previous mitigation action. So part of the LHMP is to any mitigation action you have in it, they want to know, did you complete that? Did you, you know, and it's fine even if you say, you know, the town chose not to pursue that action or, you know, <coughs> conditions have changed, whatever the reasoning. Uh, you just have to basically make a statement on it. Uh, finish that piece up. That'll take the plan up in the, without the maps, 50 to 60, uh, about 60 pages, because uh, it takes multiple pages to put all that stuff in. Uh, yeah, and then I would like to be back here. I don't know when your first select board meeting in, in July is, but. Uh, first Monday in July. July 1st. First, yeah, see, I don't know if I can make that. I'm on vacation. Yeah. <laughs> then you should uh, So it'll be uh, July 15th. Yeah, yeah, that would that would work great. I would love to have that. <laughs> so then I can move on to the next step. Okay, and that's a, the point at which uh, we we would move to adopt the yes. uh, LM LHMP. LHMP. <laughs> It's all right. Uh, excuse me, Keith, can I save this uh, PowerPoint you gave me if I can put it in my minute? Yes, yes, you may. Now, is it a lot of like, like, because I know we have approved our local emergency management plan. Yes. Uh, yeah, your mitigation plan. Yeah, your emergency yeah. management plan. Right. On that, uh, Tom sent me the plan. As I say, I don't know if I, I hadn't got the adoption page yet. Uh, okay, so that was the that's, one. Okay, that's yeah. the missing yeah. link. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I already looked it over. That's all good. Uh, I just need that adoption page because if I send it to VM, they'll just kick it right back to me without it, you know. Uh, okay. I thought I'd send that, but if not, I'll send it tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's why I thought when you said that, I said, yep. well, I thought that's like a. No, yeah, it's a, it's a, and that's what I figured I'd just see Tom after the meeting. Okay. <laughs> Uh, does anybody have any questions? Uh, not for you, but mostly for uh, Tom or Neil or staff. Is um, in terms of next steps for the select board, are we all sending our top favorite, <laughs> most exciting mitigation measures to you by July one, so that they can get to Keith in time, or something similar? I don't know what timeline works. Um, I'm willing to compile it. If you can't tell, I love planning. But like, <laughs> how, how are we getting all of the select board input into one place to have a list right. of what we think the top ones are? Obviously, recognizing there's a survey and other ways for folks to contribute. Well, we do have another meeting later in June. Oh, we'll so that would be June. an exciting yeah. opportunity, wouldn't it? Wow. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, that's that's about all I really have. And like I said, it's quick, easy. I mean, it's more of an exercise, mm -hmm. you know, whether we, you want to, you know, as I say, some some towns are like, oh, I want to fill it out right now. Others, I, I would rather you actually take your time and mm -hmm. think it through. We're you know, a diverse group, so yeah, 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 exactly. And go uh, home than others. Heck yeah, and uh, yeah, once you complete that, if if you <laughs> if you want to compile it or if you want to send it to me, either way, it's all good. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, be happy to uh, get this wrapped up. All right, Mike. So, Roger, should we then, prior to the next meeting, get our comments to Alyssa? That would be great. Yeah, and okay. I think Roger even might have said maybe when we get to next meeting agenda, we can yeah. do some of it in the meeting too. That's, that's easier. Well, I, so. like, I know you offered. I just wanted to make sure that was a date. Mm -hmm. Get it in our. And we wouldn't want to deprive our uh, planning uh, <laughs> director the opportunity to get. <coughs> His best wishes in there as well. I was trying to not be directing other staff, so I was <laughs> referring to Tom first. Tom first. Change the man. <laughs> okay, Keith, thank, thank you. Uh, right. Tom? One 20 second note. Um, the last plan five years ago included train derailments. That cannot be in this plan. The rules have changed, and it has to be natural hazards only. Yeah. We have, there is a small is aware of it, so they can work on their own planning. And the train going off the tracks not considered natural. <laughs> <laughs> the, the natural disaster preparedness committee is co considering it a natural disaster. Blown <laughs> <laughs> off by wind. It's so if it's natural, not considered yeah, at the state level right. or federally. It's considered by that committee. All right. Well, cool. 
Keith has his own standards. So. Heck yeah. Yeah, actually, I did include some text about uh, 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 hazmat, you know, mm -hmm. uh, hazardous material uh, uh, accidents and that sort of thing, uh, because it was in the previous plan and with when originally meeting with the town. Mm -hmm. uh, you definitely said you were interested, uh, and uh, so we, we did keep some text. It's not a huge amount, but uh, I definitely looked through the commodity studies and uh, what is primarily uh, passing through the town mm -hmm. to uh, make sure we called that out. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, technically, is there a reason for worry? Uh, actually, the numbers overall have uh, for accidents have decreased in the state due to, uh, I guess, better enforcement. Uh, and uh, better responses from uh, training with hazardous materials, but uh, I definitely you know would recommend the town uh, with both the railroad and the interstate being here to uh, continue you know making sure the fire department trains with the uh, state hazmat team with Patrick McLaughlin and his team. Uh, yeah, they're a great asset, and you know, obviously last year we're very active in uh, flood response as well. Yeah. If they're not traveling off the road, not Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Keith, thank you very much. That was very in mind. Appreciate it. Oh. Uh, don't forget. Uh, is there any other style of disaster you'd like the Natural Disaster Committee to, to consider? Uh, that <laughs> is not on the agenda. <laughs> <laughs> so I will keep it. Let me know. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Next on the agenda is the Welcoming and Engaging Community Cohort Update. Anyone care to provide uh, some input on that? Rachel stayed this whole time if she wants to come up only because Tom, <laughs> yeah. Tom, Rachel, and I were the designated appointees for the town. Um, oh, oh, please. What was this? All right. <laughs> well, yeah. um, I asked for this to be on the agenda, and it's truly just mostly an informational update. This is something that the Vermont League of Cities and Towns put on that we participated in over the last seven months, something like that. Um, and with uh, 12 total participants, it included a number of other towns and also two regional planning commissions, um, and was just an opportunity, um, included some data collection at the beginning, if anyone remembers taking a survey that went out to all municipal staff, but also all of our boards and appointees and elected committees, um, talking about inclusion and belonging, um, we got results back from that. Um, I would say overall, Waterbury did pretty well in terms of folks enjoying working here. Um, and then the big ending wrap up piece of the class was around kind of like an action plan and next steps. Um, and Tom and Rachel and I met and what we kind of decided is like, we weren't gonna make a plan on behalf of everyone. <laughs> we learned a lot. We had a lot of questions about what to do next and we just felt like it wasn't um, on us to kind of decide that for the group. But I would say we definitely had some themes around wanting to hear more input from members of the community. Um, Rachel in particular offered real expertise in terms of the strategic planning process the library went through. Um, they did a lot of awesome things like sit at the farmer's market and just hear from folks in town. Um, so I feel like those were some of the ideas we talked about implementing, but I guess I would just offer this to say, obviously Tom and Rachel can fill in, but um, we did some learning, we did a lot, we learned that we want to engage with the community more, and it felt important to make sure that was something everyone was interested in, and then talk about how we want to do it, whether it's, you know, I know community supper events have come up before, again, farmer's market is one idea, um, there's certainly ones I'm excited about, so again, I don't think we have to get deep on tactics tonight, but just wanted folks to know that's kind of where we have landed at the end. Um, but that's just my perspective, so happy to have Tom and Rachel share that as well. Yeah, I don't have much more to add. Um, it was a good experience, and I think that uh, you know, it was interesting to see how much it overlapped with the work that the library had already done, almost as if that library strategic planning project had been a little bit of a pilot project for this, for the town. So uh, that makes me feel good that we can easily kind of manipulate that into something that's going to work for everybody um, and it's, it seems to be all about just getting out into the community and listening to people where they are and how they want to be heard um, and uh, I think there's a, a lot of potential here in Waterbury to do that. I guess I just want to say from my perspective what was interesting about it one thing that was interesting was connecting with all the other people in all the other towns um, and we sometimes have I think challenges in this room, um, or perceived challenges, things like civility and, and 
Um, you know, there's difficult issues you sometimes tackle, and people get a little bit emotional sometimes, but I feel like after talking to other towns, we're in a pretty good position. Um, hearing, you know, I don't want to name them, but um, it seems like everyone in the room had their share of really bad stories that I certainly haven't seen that behavior here, uh, which is a great thing, but it feels like in some towns there's this culture of um, kind of attacking the boards. <laughs> At meetings that ever get an opportunity, it's Who nice that <laughs> nice that we're not we're not in that position. Um, you know, pretty extreme distrust out there in some cases. Yeah, I would agree. It felt like um, I didn't quite know what to expect, but once we sort of started to hear these stories, it felt like oh, Waterbury is actually holding its own very well these days. So that was nice to see. And then I guess the one name I will say, since it's been well publicized, is you know talking to a few of the folks from Morristown. Mm -hmm. um, that have had a lot of staff turnover. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting talking to the few folks that are still there. And hopefully mm -hmm. they're ushering a new era now. Um, mm -hmm. But it made me feel pretty good about our, our future. How about uh, ethnic diversity? Uh, <coughs> Vermont tends to rank uh, fairly low in that category. Um, and. Uh, I know that there's a concern about uh, how welcoming we are to ethnic and other minority groups. Um, did that get addressed at all over, during this process? It did. Um, where I struggle with it is um, a, lot of, a lot of conversation about it, but, but how do you somehow translate that into a formal action that's, that's not... Um, that truly is effective rather than um, rather than just a display for the, mm -hmm. sake, for the sake of a display. Um, and that was a- Banner uh, isn't uh, doing? <laughs> no, it's not to criticize that. I guess a good example I'll give is if Seth Jansen, who's with the uh, Moore County Regional Planning, told a story of how he was, um, he spent part of his life going out on a, on a water project and he was, you know, marking curb stops. I think it was expanding water to a new area. Um, and so he knocked on everyone's door and you now had to go through these series of questions to people. And, and he was saying, you know, if he was, um, he might feel very differently about that if he was, um, you know, in, in rural Longwall County working on that and he was not someone who looked like the rest of us for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, knocking on doors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was just an interesting analogy that I think drove home some of the, some mm -hmm. of the challenges you could see. And I will say just like to me, it's a yes and of like one piece is one, the data did break down into different like, do you feel in, included and like you belong in the community across a ton of different dimensions of diversity, but like looking at like sexual orientation and gender and race and all of those. So saying like, we're interested in this data for everyone. And also if one group really feels like they belong and one group doesn't, that's important to know. Again, offhand, I don't think we saw huge disparities in water rate, but that was part of the like data gathering was also saying like, oh, well, it's really great if, you know, white men feel really included here and no one else feels included. Mm -hmm. That's not doing the overall job that we wanted to do. Um, so that was part of it. And then just also acknowledging in Vermont communities, we did a lot around like dimensions of diversity, like ideological perspective and where you live in a community and mm -hmm. family size and type and just acknowledging that we often can be missing out on diversity in a lot of other ways regardless like point standing around whatever the racial makeup of the community can be but also there's a whole lot of other voices that might not be in the room for a whole variety of reasons as well yeah. okay. um did they get into um like economic diversity at totally. all. Yeah. Totally. That in fact was one of like it was all around like um particularly <coughs> acknowledging like the town we are both serving our town residents and also employees and like in a workplace do we feel super welcome if we're discussing you know, vacations or something mm -hmm. and people might have really different experiences. And then I will just per Tom's point say that like this is not just a water break conversation. Um I also am on the Vermont League of Cities and Towns as an equity committee, but like what we're doing right now is around like professional support groups for municipal employees in different fields. And we're having the same conversation around like how are staff having that conversation in a way that doesn't feel targeting to or tokenizing. Um, so how do you like make resources generally available, but 
so that if folks want to participate in them, they can, but also not feel like they're being called out for whatever reason or assumed mm -hmm. that they want to participate in something like, mm -hmm. hey, we have this super cool women in local government group. If you're interested, awesome, but not, I'm going to assume that you all mm -hmm. want to participate in that. How about, how about the two uh, representatives right here? <laughs> <laughs> whatever it may be. So like, again, in that group, it was like, we're going to do a postcard and have like a one pager for the town office. You know, just thinking about ways to like have information available mm -hmm. um, just for everyone. So if, like, for example, we were to set up a little table at, uh, say, a Thursday night uh, concert in the park, we just had uh, the uh, welcoming, uh, welcoming and engaging community uh, table. Uh, or just, hey, we're your local select board table. I mean, that's about my vision, okay. but yes. <laughs> but, you know, is, is there a prescribed methodology of engaging with those people? You just talk with them. Uh, here's some, uh, I have some questions that would help us uh, get some better information about how accepted you feel or how much, uh, to what degree do you belong in this community. Um, uh, I any thoughts on that? Pretty strongly, the, uh, if we've learned anything in the class, those people would not be a phrase I would encourage. Um, but I would also just say it was about genuine engagement and conversation with everyone. And I will say like to the extent we thought we were going to enter a course and hear like this is the plan we didn't even get a format for the final project it was like come up with what you think is it's called a wicked problem like a big challenging <laughs> from problem in your community. <laughs> what are they from massachusetts oh, that wicked problem there's like a whole mental model around it something with many stakeholders and hard to solve and um I'm trying to think of what the economic model is with the sheep in the field and about the extra sheep. Um, <laughs> that energy of like a hard, complicated thing. And it was really just about saying like solving these problems long term is about relationship building and knowing uh -huh. people as individuals. So yeah. mm -hmm. at least that's my takeaway. <laughs> and I'd say listening more than talking. We talked a lot about listening and how to how to do that. And um, and I do think if you're setting up a table at the farmer's market, you'd want to do some prep work and, and be prepared with some prompt questions to get people going. But the real goal would be to let them lead and hear from them what it is they need, what they might not be getting from this community. Mm -hmm. And then how do we take that information and bring it back into uh, our circle? Yeah, is that, any, any guidance on that or is that <laughs> another question? It's, oh, it's a wicked too. problem right there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's a, where we can kind of look towards the library strategic plan and how we, we took the information we gathered from the community and turned it into action steps to spread out over the next like five years. Um, it's, it's kind of a matter until we hear from people, we don't really know what that's going to look like. So, mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's about being open minded as we take those first steps. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a clarifying uh, question? Yeah, sure. So this, if you're at the farmer's market having a conversation with someone is it more about asking them how we better reach them or whether they want their road paved or you're just allowing them to say whatever they want to say any of the above yeah. honestly i think it's great i mean i'll just say like i emailed karen today and was like thanks for including all the materials in the minutes i mean sorry the agenda because maybe people like want to see, like i don't know what people are interested in but to me mm -hmm. again just speaking for myself personally like having that all there for someone who might want it is really positive but I think we might get all of that, and that's part of like wanting to have a conversation. Maybe we ask a specific question. That's mm -hmm. how would you like to be reached, or like, do you even know who's on the select board, or what on earth we do? Mm -hmm. Like, I would love the answer to that question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, or maybe it is like, is there one project you would hope to see in the year? What's mm -hmm. your biggest complaint about local government? Like, we can write the questions. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess to mm -hmm. me, that would be something I'd be interested in. Like, what we all want to learn or change. About local government. Yeah, let's go. Mm -hmm. New favorite question. Uh, <laughs> ask a lot of people. I mean, what do you think about fishing? Wakeboarding? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> Um, can I? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, one thing I'm just envisioning this myself, and you know, sitting at the farmer's market, and I feel like people bringing issues to select board members. Um, and it's not, you know, my initial fear is I don't have the answers for these people. I don't have enough historical knowledge of this town and I'm really worried about that. But I do think I can ask a lot of questions too. You know, if they're saying, I want my road to be paved. Oh, what's going on? How, you know, what are the things that are causing <clears throat> difficulties? And I feel like you can roll with that. And that information, even if it's not collected in a, you know, in a sort of system that we develop, but just bringing that knowledge to these meetings of knowing what local community members are going through and need, I feel like is a really strong asset to 
the select board. In, in a situation like you just described, you just say, tell me about what your problem is, and I may not know, and I'll get back to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, to me, that's what most <coughs> community residents would really want to know that you're going to be responsive to their queries, not just ignore them. And you can yeah. shoot me a test. If I don't know it, I can probably get it from Woody. Don't just buffalo an answer. Just yeah. you know, say, "Hey, I got to," you know, especially being the new guy on the board. You know, you got to you know find out some information. And yeah. Oh yeah, I text Tom all the time. <laughs> hey, Tom. <laughs> yeah. I'm here for it. Good. Thank you. All right. Um, so, um, just know we are a, a little bit uh, over time. Um, do we want to? Uh, are have the concerts started on Thursdays yet? Uh, they start the thirteenth. Thirteenth. Right. Um, anyone want to volunteer to set up a little select board table at the uh, at the farmers market slash uh, concert? I'm typically there for Rotary, so. Yeah. I'd be glad to do a dual purpose. And we should just right. ask the farmer's market. Yeah, we have to pay if we're going to a table. <laughs> uh, so the library actually has a table at, on the 13th at the farmer's market. If, uh, if somebody from select board wants to join us, we'll be there. So mm -hmm. yeah, we'll You'll be okay with us squatting Thursday. the farmer's market? Yeah, we we'll, we invite everybody. <laughs> the library table. I, I can do the late shift. I can't do the early shift. No, you got to apply. I'll be there. I can do the early shift, but I can't do the late shift. Oh, okay, fine. I'll be there for the round, so I can. Uh, I can I can join I can join you on Thursday early shift for. What we is have that? like nine people. I also will say like guys. Don't want to overwhelm us. What is the early shift? <laughs> Probably we can't have a select one. What is that? What, yeah, that's what it is. What is the early shift? We only have two. Right. Like three of a quarter. Oh, that's Tom. right. Two, two is max. And okay. So without, without a I need to press me that There's night. two. I'll scold them with the repairments. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, no, but what is the early shift? Uh, it starts at four, goes to about seven. Oh, um, we'll be selling books with the friends of the library. Yeah. So. <laughs> the concert thing's really set up as like five thirty and mm -hmm. six six thirty. And like I thought we were talking about like morning. Uh, no, no, no. This is in the evening. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's an afternoon. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, the farmers market starts at eight four. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, so 13th, we heard. 13th. Uh, Pushed it, so I'll do it. <laughs> uh, so are you in or out for? Uh, oh, no, I'll be working. Okay. All right. And I'll, I'll, I'll come. Mike will be there I'll the be whole in. time. He can, he can tell us. And, uh, go, go in and then. Six and go seven. And it sounds like maybe that's a good just intro. We have someone at the table, and then we can touch base at our next meeting around if it works. Right. So we we'll want to have set plans. See what the, uh, what the outcome is. Great. All right. Uh, if everyone's okay, we'll move on to the next item. Uh, State police contract. Thank you. Let okay. me uh, thank you. Right. We'll pass these around. Mm -hmm. The contract is Vermont's standard template because they have contracts with other towns. We're unique in that we've got designated troopers, but. <laughs> the format of the contract is the state format. Um, I was going to say, yeah. does anybody want to talk about I'll one. make one? Yeah. I'll go make you one. Thank you. Yeah. And here's one extra. Oh, you have an extra. Thank you. One other one? I'm good with one. <laughs> Let me um, point out a couple couple things that are important. Um, um, page one is essentially standard. Page two has, I think, a meaningful change. Um, highlighted section on page two um, essentially says that if the, uh, if the select board decides um, that they want additional services, and the state public service, uh, public safety commissioner agrees, mostly that boils down to staffing on their part, that Waterbury could add additional troopers. Um, so it's an option. Both parties have to approve it. It begins with the select board making the request. Mm -hmm. And the cost would simply be the final cost, which is based on two. And, and if it's one 
additional trooper, divide that by one. Your fifty percent cost increase. If you want to double it, it doubles. Mm -hmm. In reality, for the next three years, it's unless something changes at the recruiting classes, it's largely theoretical. Um, but it may come into play at some point, and so there's no harm in having an option that both parties have to approve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. I thought at the town meeting you said that the new contract would not be a three year contract, that at a certain point there would be some options to change it, like if we decided to bring in our own police. So the contract has an out clause of 30 days. Okay. Um, moving on to. Um, page five. Um, that's the top of page five outlines the, the shifts the troopers do. Um, it does give uh, the state discretion to change those shifts, and that's largely because the, the troopers are all part of the union, the union has a contract, um, and if the union votes to modify shifts, um, Waterbury is a bit of a dangling participle there. Um, and that, I think, creates friction because the troopers vote a certain way and, and you know, essentially the state then has that right to, to modify it. But I think what's clear and what's well understood is that um, we're not paying for overlap. We're paying for two troopers to give us 80 hours of coverage. So eight <coughs> till five and then five until two and more? Yep, and they've in the past been flexible about modifying shifts at our request. Mm -hmm. um, for things like Arts Fest. Right, yeah. Um, may I ask a clarification? Yes. Okay. Um, so that's not their, the eight to five, right, is, that's not their shift. That is the time they're spending in Waterbury. <laughs> or is it their full shift from when they leave the barracks to when they get back to the barracks? Mm -hmm. That's their shift. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, second part in the, in the middle of the page is that there's some financial protection for the town um, in the absence they don't have an, in the instance they don't have an officer. So we haven't been in um, situated side of the year where there hasn't been an officer. We've been in a situation where there's been acting commanders, but they maintain the, the two staff. Um, the The out clauses are at the bottom of page six. There's both a termination for clause and a termination for convenience. Mm -hmm. um, the following page is the cost, and it shows the old cost in the old table in strike through, but you can still read it in the new one. And what's, what's interesting to me is the total salaries um, over three years for the, for the two troopers. Um, 520 grand, um, the last one 478. So in three years, it's not a massive increase. Um, the, the, the benefits um, are a bigger increase. It's understandable with health care. What, what's, what's incredible um, is the vehicle. Yeah. Um, you know, the vehicle costs more than doubled. Um, hmm. And that's what's, I think, driving a large part of it. So the, um, the old number. <coughs> Which was exactly level for three years was three hundred eighty-five thousand. Mm -hmm. um, the new number is four seventy-seven. Wow! Now, this year, since it, it's a contract that begins July first, we pay half of the increase. So the budget had four hundred fifteen thousand, um, but the but the cost is shifted four hundred thirty-one. So a little short in that regard. I think nothing we can't manage through and have a level budget. Um, but next year we would go from four fifteen in the budget to four seventy-seven. So we're um, we're poking at a, a penny on the tax rate for the state police increase. Um, talk to them about having a different format for payments so there's more regular increases rather than being sort of hit hard every three years, and that's just not a model they do. Hmm. Um, so you absorb it once, but then you're level, so it's not. So it'll be level for the next three years? Be level for three years, yeah, which is why you have a big increase every yeah. three years. So. Um, and then nothing in this contract, um, you know, there's a termination for convenience clause, but there's also no clause related to utilizing other police forces if desired and if they're available. So if we wanted to 
um, stick with two troopers, but also say that um, we wanted to engage with a county sheriff or a different town with a different police force to provide some supplemental services. You're certainly not prohibited from doing that. I do wonder why the vehicle operation costs have more than doubled. A big part Is it of just that. The price of gas. No, it's the vehicles themselves. Um, yeah. Police cruisers used to be, so, so a couple things have changed. The first is um, you, you, you generally don't see cruisers that are sedans anymore. Um, it's it's four-wheel drive, right. Ford Explorers. But another reason is that um, the auto manufacturers at some point during COVID um, essentially essentially cease bidding on state um, the state bids out police cruisers and the manufacturers you know they get an order for a hundred for the year from a different state and they uh, and they essentially um, I don't know if they didn't bid or if they or if they modified their own process but there was a very deep discount on municipal vehicles it's no longer available mm. and that discount was now, I forget, but I remember buying vehicles for St. Albans and just looking at the vehicle on the lot versus the vehicle we're buying, and it was dramatic in percentage terms. So that's a big part of it. The equipment in a cruiser is yeah, just astronomically. It's essentially the cost of the cruiser. Was just a few years ago. Mm -hmm. electronic. Oh, you buy a police cruiser, and you, you send it away for three months to get fit up before you use it. That's just part of the, part of the process. Electronics, radios, lights, all these things. They've all got um, just a ton of technology. I know being on the State Police Advisory <coughs> Board, they even when we were still involved with that, you know, they were looking at the cost of, you know, state vehicles were just going <coughs> through the roof. Yeah. And it's cost and plus just gas and repairs. We we all see that in our own, you know, you know, home home budgets, you know. Just expensive. Uh, I guess I imagine we're not in a great position to negotiate any of these figures. I guess the one thing I, I will say in my in my eighteen months is that um, I don't have a sense from the comments and the conversations I've had with the public about a clear sentiment for this in general. I probably think a third of the people I talk to essentially say it's okay, it's worth the money. A third of the people say um, we're paying an awful lot and not getting an awful lot, and a third of people say it's great. Um, the people that say it's great, the one thing I will say, tend to be more in Waterbury Center, and their sentiment is, well, the village dissolved and we got a police force out of it. Worked out for us. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, from my perspective, um, The local police forces that we could partner with, in theory, Stowe and Montpelier, are really short-staffed. So it's out of the question, even really having the conversation. Um, I could see that at some point again, if people start applying, and the academy is able, you know, the academy is flush. Could there be some period years down the line where there could be some? Know, a joint role with Waterbury in another town. I, I think that's the model. I think that's the preferred model to, to regionalize the local forces. Um, you know, my, my fear is at some point the state police will, will say we've got staffing challenges. Um, and, and we may go down to one officer for a time, and that may not be 10 days. Um, or they may say to us, you know, not tomorrow, but at some future point that. They just might not be able to staff it, so we should plan for you know twenty twenty seven something like that. So then we're in a real bind. Um, I think if that conversation were to happen, this this would feel like an awful bargain. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because I get the biggest complaint I get is speeding, and it, and and half the time it's there's too much speeding, and other half is there's too much enforcement. <laughs> <laughs> That's just the way of the world. Uh, <laughs> then switch one of those people that I saw. <laughs> I can um, the comment. The, um, there was a question about the, the reports uh, coming back uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> there's a, a 
list of all the different things that, that yep. we should be getting reported on? Is that the result? result? They're, they're, they're getting more and more results, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Uh, Mike. I guess I'm confused. When you said there's an option to like add another, and I assume that doesn't include, not included in the 477. No, so if, 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 if the select board wanted to add an officer and the state had the staffing, half, take half of that 477, so you know, 238, and that's your additional cost for the year. Okay. That's right. So it's a known figure at least. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, so the gaps, they're pretty big. So Saturday, we're not having anybody during the day. And then nobody on Sunday. And then people, troopers start their shift at eight o'clock, wherever they live. So they get in their car at eight o'clock. I just see that as a lot of gaps. So that's why the data is important to me to see when uh, non Waterbury troopers responding to Waterbury. I'm interested in the turnaround time, not the turnaround time, but the how long it takes them to get here from Berlin. Um, I just think we could do better. I think that not having a police force on the weekends in the village where I live, I think it's a pretty big deal just to feel safe. So I know that back in 2018, this was a project. It was a VSP project. Like, is it working or isn't it working? And we're gonna determine if it's working by looking at the data. And the reports were great and we saw exactly what was happening while the troopers were here and also when they weren't here. And we got how long the response time was and I thought the select board was going to review that to see, is it working? Isn't it working? Is it good? Is it bad? But then we were skipping all this data from 2022 once the barracks moved from Middlesex to Berlin. So there's no way to tell if it's working or not working, really, because there's no data. So this project, is it now just the way it is? And I don't want to talk about staffing, because everybody's short on staffing, and I appreciate the staffing part. But I think that with the 1% option tax, and there was a study done in 2017, I'm telling a story from a long time ago, that was presented, the select board and um, the trustees presented it, and they said in that presentation that if there was ever a 1% option tax, there would be a good possibility that the 1% could go toward a village police department, or a Waterbury village department, Waterbury police department. So is this still a project that we're looking at, or are we just blindly going, we're getting what we can get, Good enough. It's better than nothing. Uh, I, I haven't been directed to look into um, recreating old police force. I can tell you, you know, our one percent option tax is going to be in the range of, you know, hopefully seven hundred thousand dollars next year. Um, for the tiniest of departments, you're about half the cost. Um, for a department that's and I, I really struggle um, because small departments have, just have a history of being ineffective. You know, you need a certain size promotional opportunities. Um, <clears throat> and you also, if you create, and, and even assume for a minute there was a budget and an adopted plan to create a police department, um, year one, you're hiring a chief, um, you're trying to hire other staff, you're, you're, you know, you're building your, your station, um, all the IT work, all those related things. So you're investing an awful lot up front before you have any police coverage. Um, you know, I dare say you're investing half a million plus the first year just to hire a chief and get a building up and running. And, and um, you know, never mind policies, never mind training, never mind the rest of the officers, never mind the vehicles. So it's um, it's certainly an option, but. You know, going back to that rough number of a penny in your tax rate is 75 grand. Um, you know, your tax rate now is 53 cents, 55 cents. Do you want it to be 80? Uh, that's probably not unrealistic. That where we wind up. Um, it's um, the history of Vermont towns is just the small departments. There's no promotional opportunities. Um, they tend to be training grounds for the larger departments. Um, and then you're also in a really competitive environment because everyone's unionized, so you've got to, you've got to match the hatch, you've got to pay, give the pay and benefits everyone else is getting. Um, 
and it's higher than it's ever been. So it's it's a difficult, expensive proposition. And the other hugest challenge is you. Um, how do you sell staff on coming to Waterbury, um, which is brand new? Um, There's no, a lot of reserve land. You know. <laughs> <laughs> got white trucks everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> the facts, the facts are that we're growing. We're bringing in a lot more people. We've got a 51 South Main Street's coming up. There's another rental right where HR Block is. A lot more people are coming in. And I think that with more people, there's gonna be more trouble. And that's, and when you say, I live in the village right on Main Street. I'm telling you, people are speeding through there. It is fast, so, and it's on weekends. And actually it's all the time. But weekends especially, I see it. So I just think, I hope we don't wait for some kind of root cause thing to happen before we have to do something. Sounds like you're saying nobody wants to work in Waterbury, everybody wants to live in Waterbury. No, I'm, I'm, I mean, I don't know, but something's gonna happen. And the bars are open, people are coming in. It's just, I'm, it's I'm scary. Not, we can't measure what's not being measured. Like all those calls that when there, nobody's here. But let me, um. Let me clarify it. So when I applied for the job, there was an essay requirement that I wrote um, <laughs> about creating a police department. And, and I put in there a budget, and I put a little tool in in a spreadsheet where you could change the number of officers, and, and it all updates automatically. I remember working on it. I thought it was kind of clever. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you hire him? But I remember a specific phrase I used in the memo I wrote, and what I said was, it's a theoretical exercise because the officers do not exist. And that hasn't changed. Um, I mean, Stowe is at half mast. Yeah, two retired. Mm -hmm. um, and no one to replace them. You know, Montpelier is at half mast. Um, so it's it's truly theoretical. And the state police are at 40% vacancy. Uh, I mean, you give me a budget. I, I, can't, I can't spend the money. I can get you a building. I can get you cruisers. I can't get you the officers. Mm -hmm. So. You're not, you're not wrong in that I do hear from people, especially in the village, that they don't feel like there's a need for more services. And I guess my point is, until I feel like I, could, I can logically report back to the people of this town that here's a plan, here's a cost, it's non-theoretical, there's better things to spend my time on. That being said, if the select board tells me to work on it, I follow orders and do it. Well, I propose that when you say that you hear one third are like dissatisfied, one third are like it's working, one third are like, hey, it's great. Um, publicize this contract and publicize the gaps. I don't think people know. I mean, I pay attention, I started paying attention to the public safety data, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think people realize the gaps. And I think that people should be aware and pay <coughs> attention and, and let them know what's going on in their village and in their town so that they are just aware. So the one, I guess the one thing I will say is that um, <coughs> we have a new county sheriff. I spoke to him earlier this year. Um, haven't spoken to him in a, in a while, but what he said is that um, the county sheriff traditionally has contracts to provide coverage to certain towns, and mm -hmm. that um, he could provide coverage to Waterbury, but he had to get back to me because he wanted to be sure he could honor his traditional contracts. Um, my conversation was, with him was more about things like special events. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't about an ongoing gap coverage. But I can, town meeting day has come and gone. Those contracts are now in place. So I can certainly call the county sheriff. And, and if there's a desire to consider for the future covering those gaps, that's a possibility. I don't believe it's a possibility with Stella Montpelier. Mm -hmm. okay. Alyssa, you have a hand a few things uh, on technicalities four and five reference the Middlesex barracks and should be updated to Berlin for technicality. Um, I would say I hear you on the data. I appreciate that you've really been pushing on the data. To me, the fact that the data is enumerated in the contract is very pleasant in terms of us having something to point to. Um, I'll speak for myself and just say, I also live on South Main Street. I'm 29, I'm a single female. I walk downtown to the bars and the restaurants at night. I do feel very solid from Waterbury. I have a partner who does not live in Waterbury, who lives in a community with a full-time police force, who frequently remarks how often he sees the state police here on Saturdays. And that's just anecdotal. I'm giving you just an anecdote, but I'm just saying, like, as a select board person, I'm living downtown in my community and seeing 
police presence and I'm feeling comfortable with the level of service we're receiving. I hear you that we need the data. So I think everyone on the select board, but I'll say I certainly think we should be looking at the data regularly. That has been a gap. I want to acknowledge that. I was here in 2017. I was the economic development director. I went to the police study commission meetings because I was interested. I think Michelle Baker did the local option tax calculation. It was $415,000 if I'm remembering correctly, which just is shocking to say that we're anticipating 700,000 implementing it. As I recall, that was one potential funding option. So I'm not negating the point that I give you a lot of credit value for continuing to raise around, this is a conversation we need to have, we're growing. In terms of where I'm sitting tonight as a select board member, I do think this contract is just a thing we're gonna do because I think it is the best option we have right now with the constraints in our community in terms of what Tom said, meeting the a third, a third, a third. We have a third who want nothing, we have a third who want more, we have a third who are well served. So my vote tonight is going to be, yes, we absolutely should do this contract. It's the right thing to do. I'm sorry it came in above budget. If I thought we could negotiate on that, we would. I think that we need to commit to continuing to examining the data because I hear you. There is this weird gap where there isn't a good between, but I don't see a better alternative right now. So for me tonight, this contract is the right choice. And I think committing to continuing to look at the data and look at other conversations as you push for and again giving you credit makes sense. But for me tonight, that's where I'm at. Thank you. Uh, yeah, up here, I got Danny Kelman. Uh, thanks so much. And I don't want to take too much time. Um, I really appreciate that you bring the contracts, you know, with transparency that you uh, continue to invite um, the troopers and and the captains to come and speak and, and then also review you know, the the reports. So I think that's really helpful in terms of transparency. I'd echo what Alyssa said. I think it can be really helpful to review the information a little bit more regularly, maybe put it on that rotating calendar, you know, a couple of times a year or what have you. But what I'd like to maybe broach is like we talk about whether something's working or not. And I guess what I'm unclear about is like what the level of assessment is. What does working mean? Is it subjective? Is it objective? You know, is it just based on what we hear from the community, are there numbers, are there, you know, and and did we, how did we evaluate when we had a police force and whether it was effective or not? I was here when we did and when we voted to make that change, but I'd be curious, you know, so how, how do we assess what's working, what isn't working um, in a less subjective way? And and I don't, I don't know what that is. I don't know if there's a framework that exists or that other communities use, but um, I think otherwise it's, it's opinions, which are important, but um, maybe don't help us drill down further. So I think that's it. And thanks so much for the long conversation. Uh, yeah, I've, there's another hand up here, Mike, and then we'll get Great. back to you. Uh, all I see is an A next to the hand. And, and. Yes, good evening. Um, well, I, I haven't seen the current con uh, proposed contract, but, um, <laughs> yes, but I uh, I've lived here for on South Main Street for going on thirty eight years, uh, so I've seen a number of police groupings or police <laughs> force come and go. Uh, I can't uh, agree that we are safe on South Main Street. I'm not comfortable any longer walking my dog at 10 o'clock at night on South Main Street. There's too much traffic going on. Uh, there's too much noise. And there are people wandering around, uh, particularly the parking. Maybe it'll be better after 51 is built but it's there are people wandering around that parking lot uh more so th through the summer than uh we had during the winter but we need more i realize the costs are just getting higher and higher but we really need more police coverage particularly on weekends uh and going at least until 12, 1 o'clock at night. Uh, maybe they could start later in the mornings. 
uh, I don't know without seeing any of the data whether we need traffic control at six o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning uh, as much as we need uh, safety at 11, 12 o'clock at night. But thank you for looking into it. It ain't easy, I know that. Thank you. Mike. I'm in firm agreement with what Alyssa's comments were. As much as I know, you know, everyone has their wants, everyone wants to feel safe, and I really acknowledge that fact. But I know people from all over the state from big municipalities, small municipalities. The problem is small municipalities can't afford full-time police. A lot of the municipalities wind up having just state police coverage, just as, as a general matter. They don't even have a contract, so they don't have people permanently, you know, if you have a problem, you call the state police and, and they show up. You know, I think this contract provides us with a, a lot of benefits. Yes, maybe if there's some revision, as I think Ann said, to the hours, I think the evening hours are probably the most critical times. But for us to start up a police force with the effects that we have on our tax rates, I just think it's going to be, it's not, it's not an economical, you know, reality. You know, we're, we're, we're not a municipality of 10 or 15,000 people to have. And you look at the ones with 10 or 15,000 people, they have trouble maintaining their police forces. So it's not, it's not just having a, our own police force. I think that's going to create a whole bunch of challenges. As Tom kind of said, we're going to be a training ground for the bigger you know, police forces, and I think this contract offers us an alternative. Yes, maybe we need to supplement it to meet the needs of our... I'm sorry if I felt, if you felt like I didn't like the contract. No, I, just I was wondering if the project is now just the way it is, so I'm sorry you felt like you had to... I don't think it is. I think over the course of time, I now have been on the select board quite a bit of time. I've been on the state police advisory board and as a matter of fact, that state police advisory board became defunct because of lack of, you know, I attended all the meetings, but a lot of people from the 18 municipalities who were part of the Central Vermont uh, advisory board, you know, we, we couldn't do things. But you heard from the other municipalities, everyone fights, you know, everyone wants to have safe streets, everyone wants to have, you know, the drug problems get, getting worse as our you know, the population rises, we're probably going to have more drugs. You know, I think the biggest thing we always seem to hear is speeding, speeding and noise. Those are kind of the, the primary things we're hearing now. I think a lot of the time, I hate to say that the troopers are facing, there are some more and more drug issues that they're having to deal with and aiding sometimes investigation from other municipalities. And that's just, you know, part of the policing process. But there's no easy answer. I, I, I don't want to, <laughs> to minimize, you know, what... I just wanted to bring it to the table, so thank mm -hmm. you for listening. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, I'm going to pitch it again, because every time this comes up, I pitch the idea, but consider a constable. Mm -hmm. Do you know one? Wait. <laughs> I don't know. I'm not <laughs> Do you want, you want a job? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, which we certainly can do. Tom mentioned that we can have additional police force in addition to this con co uh, contract, but what we're here to do uh, at this moment is to consider the, the contract before us. Tom, uh, there have been a couple of comments about shifting the, the uh, coverage so that we would have uh, police coverage here during the evening hours over the weekend. Uh, is that conceivable, uh, conceivable change? Or? I, I can ask, but I, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been the largest <coughs> ask that I've heard is weekend coverage outside right. of this building. Yeah. 
Right, and particularly in the evening as well. Yeah, right. uh, but uh, the troopers have, you know, they have their lives too. It's, it's a I know, deal. and they have a union, and mm -hmm. um, there's all they only have sixty percent uh, coverage as it as it is. So it's not like oh easy. It's like everything is negotiable. Um, I move to approve the police contract as written. I second it. Moved and, uh, and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? Okay, contract is approved. Just, just to note, if there, if there is a desire for additional services, um, Let's have that conversation well before the budget starts, because mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's it's would take some months to get those services into place in all likelihood. So if we have that conversation, you know, in December and try to get something into the budget, um, it may be contingent on the county sheriff or or another agency making sure they have the coverage. So from their perspective, the more time to prepare, the better. Mm -hmm. Well, would, would it be Washington County Sheriff's? I know we've used sometimes the Moyle County Sheriff's. They're actually closer. If, if, if Sheriff Marcou, I mean, they're all licensed law enforcement officers in the state of Vermont, so if Sheriff right. Marcou offered a competitive rate and could provide the coverage, hmm. um, it's up to the board if they wanted to consider that option. Sure. Yeah, and I think Teller's point, uh, a couple of different people have made a point that. Uh, have it, uh, maybe it was Danny, uh, about having uh, more consistent uh, data evaluation uh, as to what does uh, what what, is, what does working uh, public safety mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, and we're working on the data. Actually, Sally Dillon, who works at the dispatch center, is is the one pulling that together. Um, they're also short on dispatchers, so that's been a bit of a challenge. Um, mm -hmm. The other part is, since I've been here, I'm on my third commander for the Berlin Barracks. Yes. Mm -hmm. But I like this TJ. I like TJ a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've liked them all, actually. They've oh, all been really, no really good. <laughs> <laughs> but they're new. Right. OK, let's move forward. We're a little bit behind. Um, the noise concerns, preliminary discussion. Is uh, something that uh, Ann Inhofe brought up uh, a couple of years ago, um, maybe more. Um, and I think it's been hiding in the parking lot for a while uh, due to lack of enforcement. Um, <laughs> go ahead. He was asking about the animal control ordinance, but I don't. I didn't put it on the website because we didn't adopt it. Okay. Give a thunder. So what are these noise concerns? Yeah. Uh, well, Anne did speak to this uh, a bit uh, to get it onto the agenda, and I think she was yes, referring to a, uh, an occasion uh, a couple of years ago uh, that uh, caused some noise into the wee hours of the morning. Uh, <laughs> should we make a motion that? that you can't have and any then, more parties? Hmm? So should we make a motion that you can't have any more parties? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm having my party at the Fish and Game Club. So. <laughs> <laughs> the neighbors up there are yeah, no yeah, that's that's right. Right. neighbors out <laughs> there. That's that's Chris smells. We complain. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's, yeah, that, that has been taken care of. But uh, she also mentioned that uh, Lefty Saya, uh, God rest his soul, uh, used to be equipped with a decibel meter and as a village trustee would uh, walk around and uh, measure noise levels uh, if there was a complaint. We no longer have village trustees. We don't know what happened to the decibel meter. There's an app for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not terribly effective. Okay. We can just get one. Well, that might be in the it's vault. It's all the planning thing. It could be in the vault? Yeah, it's all the Okay, we'll look for it. Oh, it is an app right there. Thanks, Evan. Okay. All right. Well, let's see you at your Well, I was going to say, um, no, um, though I wouldn't doubt that Lefty would do that of his own accord, I would also note that the then Village of Waterbury had a noise ordinance and had some state or some state around 80 decibels. So that might be something that we could look into. Yeah. 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 Ye
good call. So I don't think he was just doing that <laughs> on his own purview. <laughs> right. It was under the jurisdiction, <laughs> whether uh, good legal enforcement practice or not. Um, I think there was actually the village had some standards around noise ordinance. Obviously, we don't have a village anymore. So mm -hmm. noting that. We don't have an ordinance. I'm trying to find a historic one, and I can't right now. I was saying, if it's in the new zoning plan, there, there's something about noise and decibel levels. I don't even call But that would be a new standard, right? I'm just guessing you where it would have lived. Yeah, yeah, I do yeah. think, right, right, that they had some standards around, like, border from a property and defining mm -hmm. different uses. Yeah. But I guess, per my point, just when left user, I know the entertainment permit and conscience in the park, they had 80 decibels. But do you know, did the village have a noise ordinance? I'm 95% sure it did. I'll try and find it. <laughs> <coughs> and I imagine there was some timing uh, to uh, when you could make noise and when you couldn't. Uh, Anne. Yeah. Um, Skip would probably be the best person to check with about where that meter, uh, noise meter, might be. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, the village did have a noise ordinance uh, and a timing which uh, was, I think, 11 or 11 o'clock at night. Uh, it's mostly, it was mostly for Lefty walking around, uh, was when there were um, concerts at the bars, uh, whether, well, not concerts, but having musicians. Live music. Uh, at the bars. Uh, would sometimes run very late, but in addition, you know, private parties and uh, I don't know how many people really stay up past eleven o'clock anymore, but apparently some do. So, particularly <laughs> during the summer, everybody so wants to be out. Be. <laughs> people want to be outside sure. and enjoy the evening. Anyway. I check. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, with Skip. <laughs> okay. Well, we can certainly check with Skip and see you know what he uh, he what, what equipment he's got one. and what he knows about the uh, village or <coughs> past village ordinance. Other uh, would suggestions, they, concerns. Go ahead. Uh, would a noise ordinance interfere with? Entertainment permits. Would we have to change our entertainment permit to accompany the noise ordinance? Well, I think a noise ordinance would supersede supersede, supersede. any right. uh, that they would just have to would comply that, with. Would that ordinance. hamper downtown enjoyment? So, what is eighty decibels? Pretty high. Really high. <laughs> <laughs> Evan can tell us. <laughs> what are the rules? Sixty-five. Sixty-five is what we're talking about now. Eighty-five is what I see in past entertainment conditions. That, okay. that would be outdoors. So, in my experience, and I've done a tiny bit of this with the decibel reader, the consistent violators are the cars and motorcycles, and the cars with the big mufflers. Yep. Mm -hmm. Even if there was a red sensor, that's a piece of the yeah, yeah. Everything that's normal is <laughs> like over 80. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, I have one, I've had one complaint about the Jake brakes coming down the ramp from, uh, yeah. from the interstate there. Mm -hmm. they, those, that's got to be. I've heard a couple of complaints of, of truckers popping their engine brakes through town. Mm. Uh, which is cute. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, Anne and then Melissa. Yeah, there's there's also been um, from somewhere close to the state complex, the end of Randall Street. Somebody has a motorcycle that they rev up, and you can hear them go up Randall Street, through Elm Street, down South Main Street, turns around, comes back retraces his steps and he does it particularly on weekends when there's no police coverage so uh but that, there are a couple of guys that really rub up their motorcycles uh on the weekends not when the police are in town but when there's nobody covering 
I don't know what you can do about it. But. Well, you got pretty good directional hearing there, Ann. And I would, I would say that the weekends are probably when their free time is, and that's probably when they can get their motorcycles out. I don't think they are coordinating it with less police coverage. I think it just falls on the days. Hmm. That they don't know how devious these motorcycle drivers are. Okay. Uh, um, I move that we continue this conversation at the next meeting with the insight of the uh, ever knowledgeable Skip Flanders regarding previous village noise ordinances and also the excellent point made regarding what standards are in the zoning regs. Just yeah. to say, we should probably be in alignment with what standards are in the proposed. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. That wasn't the motion. The motion was done. I need to stop. Yeah. Karen, Karen, just stop. Oh, we're going to have a new. In addition to noise ordinance, we're going to have a motion ordinance. Yeah. I know, and I was bad at the beginning of the meeting too, Roger. No, I, I might need a stop sign. Um, so, so the motion, Karen, was just that we continue this at the next meeting with input from Skip about the village and input about noise in the updated zoning regs. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. We will Who's take this on your time. Thank you, folks. Yeah, Sam. thanks, Ed. All right. We are going to move forward. <coughs> Animal control ordinance, secondary discussion, and possible adoption. Sorry, Aaron can pull it up on the screen, but there were. Two changes from the last meeting. The first was that the decision was made on cemeteries to, 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 take, to allow to allow mm -hmm. animals, um, and the second one was to define a leash as a physical device and not a electronic device. Oh, yeah, so I came that, up with a. Um, I think we want to X this. I think it can go into its happy mode. Um, and uh, try the little folder find again. Yeah. No. Oh, here we go. Open. Yeah. And then. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And then just stop sharing, Karen, and you have to share again. It's really silly. But now that you have the word doc open. No, it says I'm screen sharing. Yes, but I don't it looks like people are listed things. over there. It's not that they don't get to see it. So, so, so okay. you're telling me to stop it and do it again? Yeah, now just say share screen, yeah. But click the one that says word document. See where it says, like, right below the screen that's Proposal. highlighted? That guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect, thank you. Oh, yeah. Same okay. Okay. yeah, there we go. So aside from deleting cemeteries, there's a there's a definition for a leash. Uh huh. Great. Um, that, that, those are the only requested changes. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. I'm sorry. I do think Tom sent me this, and I forgot to put it in the packet. So. Oh, I've seen it before. Um, do you know what pages those are on? Yep, Tom's? I think the next page. Leash. Leash. Physical restraint device. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, those were the two suggestions we had. An electric control mm -hmm. device, which is shut off. Yeah. Because the Welsh French should not be considered mm -hmm. a leash. Okay. Um, do you have the fee schedule on page nine of this, or are we adopting it separately? Um, it is, I believe it is attached to the back. No, no. Ooh. Yes. Yes. Yep. <laughs> well, you know, I thought, thank you for asking me that, Roger. I thought about that. I, I don't have any confirmation yet that the state has imposed a attack on fee. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess when and if that time comes, maybe Tom will. Yeah, and the fee schedule can be updated without updating the entire ordinance mm -hmm. and having to. Right. Yeah. So I just soon wait until that's a fact before I ask, ask <coughs> you to update fees. Yep. Mm -hmm. Uh, or uh, or we'll have the discussion going into next year because right now you know dogs are supposed to be licensed by April first, so right now I'm getting the folks who forgot and they're getting their late notices. There's already a fee on there. I don't want to now implement a new fee structure, mm -hmm. so we'll do it before the start of the next year. Uh, and one more note: I did order a sandwich board. That was a big discussion. So next year I'll have a sandwich board outside that says. Dog licenses. Dog licenses by uh, like one first or something. Yeah. It's oh, very cute that. and some yeah. graphics. That's good. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, um, can I make a friendly <laughs> suggestion? When, uh, when and if we have to revisit fees, I would highly suggest bringing the license fee down and bringing the penalty fees up. Mm -hmm. uh, license fee is only 11 bucks. I know. Do you think that that's a good yeah. disincentive? Yeah. 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 
No, five of, five of that goes to the state now. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. okay. Well, yeah. I mean, but still, the just the, the penalty, the penalty like, yeah. you know, keeping a license fee affordable well, driving the penalties up might do us some good as to getting the unlicensed dogs licensed. <laughs> Eleven dollars. I don't. It is probably no, a quarter of yeah. of a bag of dog food. Sure, but that's not what I'm saying. If we're leaving the license fee as is as eleven dollars, which is affordable and keeping it affordable, the right. violation fees should be higher. Mm -hmm. But this is what's being proposed right now. I don't know what's going I'm not just making you know suggestion <laughs> for next time. How about next time around, we uh, address this. Uh, and the only other piece is. Um, been put in phone tag, but signs are in order. Reminder signs saying, we should not, we should not, please. Uh, okay. I, I did uh, place a call to uh, the Cross uh, Vermont Trail, uh, but they did not return my call, surprisingly. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, the exact wording is, is all dogs must be leashed by order of the town clerk. Personal number. It's about to ding you fifty bucks. <laughs> um, uh, all right. I'll make a motion to uh, adopt the animal control ordinance as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? <coughs> Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any folks? Any abstentions? All right, we have a new animal control ordinance. I feel like that should be a, a celebration that's been in the parking lot. For two <laughs> right. Years, so. yeah. I was going to say vaguely <laughs> updated, yeah. but it is still. I forgot to bring the noisemakers. Um, okay, housing trust update. Secondary discussion. Mm -hmm. Secondary discussion. Uh, we right. had a couple of uh, to dos uh, after the primary discussion, or first discussion. Um, one of those was to reach out to uh, the housing task force and see if they were in a position to give this some consideration. <coughs> and then the other was to reach out to uh, um, Down Street. Yeah, I've got a meeting with Down Street on Thursday. And it's coming Thursday. Okay. And then I did some more. Uh, phone calls and emails of my own to the towns referenced in the original proposal um, to do a lot more digging on inf the infrastructure of the trust, which bore pretty good fruit. I'm not gonna lie. I, um, I sent some of my notes by email <coughs> to the select board and the chair of the housing task force. Um, so effectively, I have my notes right here. Um, effectively, they, in fewer words, their initiatives combined would be <coughs> through downstream. So whatever they're giving, which in Montpelier's case um, is not grants, it is no interest loans expected to be paid back uh, at the sale of the property. So it doesn't conflict with the hip. Um, and a construction of ADUs is what it's primarily used for. It was primarily used for down payments on houses, like a starter starter kit for first time home buyers, but it didn't it wasn't that effective and they switched over to ADUs and that's been very effective. Hmm. Hmm. Do we have uh, stats on very effective? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's see here some more. Okay. Uh what about this well, let's look at the numbers. Uh no I was just gonna say uh, Joe, the chair of the Housing Task Force, has also put this on the June Housing Task Force uh, agenda. So in terms of other follow-up uh, information coming. When do they meet again? Sorry. Uh, third Thursday, 6 to 8. And then usually there's a Zoom. This is going to interfere with our uh, time in the park, is it? May I ask a question? 13. Uh, 20. Uh, yeah, Valerie, go ahead. Is this about down the uh, deposits for rental units? 
No. Oh, okay, I misunderstood. <coughs> I thank you because I was I didn't know. Yeah, could you could you clarify what no. this actually is? Can yes, you the, I, I can read you the original proposal right now. Great. Because I expected it to change as we discussed. So let me find it. Well, or I guess I would also just offer that of like it's a second conversation. I think candidly, the first proposal was throw everything at the wall, which is to say yeah. towns have housing trust funds that do everything from first time home payer down payments mm -hmm. to supporting ADU creation like to the idea had been yeah. floated in the other so conversation awesome. about rental down payment and we said oh those are all super interesting okay. and so we're just following up on the to do's around one question was is this something that the town has to manage or can down street Tom's meeting with down street on Thursday mm -hmm. what does the housing task force think might be useful we're meeting on the 20th six to eight and came followed up with two towns that are doing this to say what is useful I guess if you want to summarize your note again Montpelier had done the down payments, found that wasn't really working. Now it's mostly doing 80. Yeah, years. so what they're doing is they're incentivizing landowners who would have already wanted to do a, a project to, to build an ADU. Um, and essentially, their funds are working in conjunction with VHIP funds, which is a, a loan and grant program from the state that effectively does the same <coughs> thing. So they're just combining state and local resources um, to get ADUs built and rented. And but and did we get any answer? Because some uh, a member of the uh, public suggested that ADUs could not be rented. Mm -hmm. Do uh, yeah. okay. yeah. um, well, they can be rented, but they fall if they are rented, they fall under the fire marshal statutes, which also include the entire house the government oh, so the, the entire rate. house has to be compliant right if, if it's but it's not an ADU if it's rented he said if it's an AD if it's truly an ADU you can't rent it is what he said so you can you can have a roommate that you share like expenses really with. <laughs> yeah it could be. I feel like I know I was like it doesn't make any sense I would That's like to get more he, said. Like he said a true ADU is not rented and if it is rented, it's not a, it's no longer an ADU. It is a duplex, and it falls under his regulation. Hmm. Just, but you can have a roommate that you share expenses with. You hmm. just can't rent it. Okay. <laughs> they can pay you money. <laughs> no, uh, they're sharing. They're sharing. But what, if you what, rent what? it. If it's a rental unit, it falls under, it's a duplex. It's no longer. Yeah, and actually, if you look up the regulations, because after you left, trust me. Trust me <laughs> and I'm like, it does, it does say that. <laughs> Which is, but I guess if you're adding an ADU and your family member is staying with you, you're opening up housing somewhere else. Which is the whole the, yeah, the whole the idea is that you're, is, right? if you're relieving some apartment yeah. somewhere, you're, at, you know, opening up a rental. Yeah. What was that? I was just saying, I think also saying that you have the most complicated situation, right? Because you said the ADU is in your home. So just to acknowledge, accessory building units could also be oh. separate, and then you could have a new building. My mm -hmm. guess is that's what's happening in but it's still, uh It actually still falls the same. But I'm saying it would have to be cool, but just the new building. If it wasn't attached to your house, or would they both still, even if they're not connected? I do not know that. So that might be a Montpelier. Um, I'll do it again and just say I would move that we revisit this conversation in July when we have updated info from the Housing Task Force down the street. Is there any way to ask our marshal to make it, you know, mm -hmm. ask you a question yeah, like or directly? So yeah. that, because I never got anything in writing. Yeah. So it also in writing would be great. Mm, right. And would be for you also, is it a logistics constraint or is it a financial constraint? Like when I think about like would, is oh, it yeah. that the cost now to upgrade your whole home is so high or that it's not no, physically possible? No, my home was fine. It was downstairs. You have to add, there's so many things I would have had to add yeah. to what I was doing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, it was financially, I mean, as it is in ADU, it was a lot more expensive than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> so adding probably additional $80,000 to do what the fire marshal wanted me to do? Hmm. Yeah, it's not feasible. Well, with this new no. housing trust, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mike, well, I think we have a motion, though. Yes, we do. Mm, yeah, do we have a motion? Do we have a second?
No sign. Motion. Mm -hmm. I just said I moved that moved. we revisit this. I was short and concise. Oh, July first, <laughs> when we have the additional information. I'll just second that. Okay. Okay. Moved and seconded. Further discussion. Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Just no. a, just a couple of comments. Uh, I I do agree on the ADU issue. I think we should have the fire marshal here to put things on the record as mm -hmm. to as to what the regulations are with mm -hmm. regard with ADU. But my comment really was on Kane's comment is where a lot of the local housing trusts don't have a lot of traction is with the down payment assistance and you know other kind of funds. Mm -hmm. The groups like uh, Vermont Housing Finance Agency and all the regional local housing organizations all have those funds set up and yeah. they're probably better better ways to yes. why recreate the wheel yeah. doing that let's do something that could really help our people if they have those alternatives would you be open to contacting them Mike? i'm just saying i made the motion around additional info. Yeah. no vhfa oh I, yeah, I know the director well, yeah but i'm saying would you be willing to either uh, write them to a meeting sure. or, or I, get that written up just so we all know it probably won't be more but i'm sure one of our you know you know housing directors and stuff like that would be glad to come down yeah, yeah. Like, like, or to the housing task force yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right yeah i'll be glad to make that contact Cool. All right, um, motion's been made to move on. Uh, just a couple things. Um, <coughs> just if we're going to have the fire marshal, try to have the fire marshal heal here, um, we should invite our state reps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, if there's regulatory changes, they would need it. The second thing, I don't, I'm trying to dig it up in my email, but Senator Ann Watson recently announced she's doing a listening tour. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have the schedule. In front of me, I'm trying to dig it up. I guess you're doing lessons on Monday nights. Yeah. <laughs> but that would be another that place. It, it, it sounds like <laughs> this is a state regulatory change that would need to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, What's yeah. a state regulatory change? Well, if, uh, if the fire, uh, if it isn't just one vindictive fire marshal, it's actually a regulation. Well, well, well this uh, was just imposed recently but. anyway. Neil, Neil. Of it. This yeah. was something very recent. Mm -hmm. What, what Sandy? <coughs> yeah. Hang on, the listening tour. I'll get it real quick. It was in front porch forum. Mm -hmm. <coughs> June eighth, eight to nine a.m. Stowe Street Cafe. Stowe Street Cafe, June eighth. So, so it's a holiday. Listening tour. So Saturday. So did you hear that? Yes, my daughter's birthday. <laughs> I'll take her to the next party. I can send her an email. Yeah, party dance there. She should be responsive. You could email all three of you. Yeah. 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 What time? On the 8th? Uh, it is uh, nine, 8 to 9 a.m. 8 to 9 a.m. Nice and early. I actually did send one to three, so. <laughs> all right. Yeah. I'll also just say, you're not alone in. in Struggling to deal with fire marshals. Mm. Heard that from, from what a lot of people have come and talked to me since then. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, we didn't get a lot of power by just saying yes. Um, <clears throat> hiring a temporary <clears throat> intern. Yes, I didn't prepare a handout for this. Um, There's a, a young lady who has um, talked with uh, first Mike Bishop in zoning, and I've met with her and Mike separately. Um, is a, a nursing student, has local work experience um, with our new software that we're working on um, for zoning. Um, it's all most effective if, if all the land records are brought into the software. Mm -hmm. So having someone to, to do some of that scanning and data entry would be valuable. Um, yeah. And then also um, that department is um, behind on some uh, 911 address issues and there's, it's not a super complex thing to do, but it's a matter of updating paperwork with the state. So there's some clerical work that could be done. We didn't budget for it per se, but we do have professional service line items that I think we're gonna be under on. So I think we're okay in budget. The person is also looking at working for um, a little over two months um, 
20 hours a week, $14 an hour. So we're not talking all the money in the world here. We're talking a few hundred bucks a week for probably nine or 10 weeks. Um, so the, it, would, it would help that office get the new software up to speed a lot faster. Um, nice to have all the historical data in the software and, and not to spend staff time on someone who makes considerably more to do things like scanning all the records in. I think it's a reasonable investment to make. Um, do I have a motion? I make a motion to approve the hiring of the technology of person to help with uh, zoning software issues. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Can I just ask when the software is rolled out? Can we get an implementation timeline? I'm just shamelessly using this discussion yeah. item to uh, say. Okay. <laughs> Why it doesn't need to be now. I just feel like between that rental registry, like knowing what that timeline looks like around the public process and staff internal. Let me, let me email that to you. I've got a, good, I've got a date in my head, but I don't want to cool. quote Mike. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Authorization to hire a temporary intern. Uh, well, little I know this. I did talk with Mike today, and, and he's working pretty quickly yeah. with these folks to get the. They're already doing testing of the payment situation and um, building, um, like forms. He came to me for example. He needed blank entertainment permit, blank special events permit, blank mm -hmm. vendors permit. Blank dog license till he found no such thing exists. Um, oh. So. So he is, yeah, he right. is really, he was at my desk today discussing these things with me. So I, I yeah. think, I think there, it's, it's going, it's, it's, going. it's moving. And maybe, and I should say that it's not a, not trying to micromanage, but of like, if and when does it make sense when it's up and running for him to come to a meeting for 15 minutes? I'm just thinking about like, of things the public interfaces with, no, that, that was, kind of permitting right. zoning and, and just always, thinking about. That was yeah. always in the works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Are going to do a dog one? That's the real question. No. So you can't. You, oh, there's so no sad. dog. There's no application to fill out. You could send me dog your... houses. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Eleven dollar dog the houses dog house permitted all use. over town. <laughs> Contact fire marshal. Okay. Uh, technology investment sprinkler system. It's built in on the dog. <laughs> so I wrote a memo um, with some concepts. Um, I don't technically need select board permission to sign a contract, um, but some of these are not within the budget plan. So on the, the first, the GPS, which is minimal, we have um, eight main work trucks, although we've got a vacancy, so really seven right now, but you know the GPS is less than $20 a month and, and went through with, with the Public Works um, director and four person and, and they they saw the demo with me and, and saw the write-up and it's cool in a sense it doesn't just track the vehicles but it gives you things like idle times it gives you speeding it gives you fast stops um the reality is well, we own the vehicle <laughs> in checking with insurance um there's a grant we can get each year through insurance if and, and if they'll give us the grant if they if we have to spend it on things that improve worker safety um, I checked to see if this would qualify, um, and, and, and I also asked about cameras. And they're actually doing pilot programs with other towns to have front-facing cameras. Mm -hmm. and, and I get the sense that will actually be required. The GPS and the camera will be a requirement in the future. Not for tomorrow, all municipal vehicles? For all the, I think, widely used vehicles where it's your daily driver, I think those days will come for us at some point. I think it may be an insurance requirement at some point. I think that has been standard tech, I, I don't think, I dare say, GPS has been very standard technology in the trucking world mm -hmm. for a long time. Cameras are becoming more and more standard. So part of this, it gives us some safeguards. Part of it is it gives the, you know, gives the poor person some management tools because if she spreads out five or six work crews during the day, she can't monitor them all. and, and She's the manager, but she's also a worker, so it's tough um, sometimes, and, and I think gives her a little bit of eyes and ears in the field. Um, and then, to be quite frank, you know, I, 
I research these, I take it over with a grain of salt when I hear it, but I get complaints. Um, that's part of the job. I'm not saying they're, they're founded per se, but sometimes it's nice when someone says, you know, last time I was out, I was at a conference, and, and I probably got four or five phone calls saying, well, your trucks are sitting at the mobile station. Um, the four person was out too. Um, it could have well been that someone went and got a coffee and then a half an hour later, a different person did, and the, someone drove by twice and said, well, you know, I did my shopping at Shaw's, and, and what are they sitting there drinking coffee for 45 minutes? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to harangue the crew, but sometimes it's nice to answer the question, mm -hmm. and I think it's nice to have, an, have a safeguard. So I think it's a reasonable investment, and I, I'd like to do that. And it's not about Big Brother, I think it's about um, the safeguards it gives us and the fact that it's now the standard for the industry. And Ken, how, uh, <coughs> how likely are we to get uh, a grant coverage from the insurance company? Uh, not for this part. Uh -huh. um, so that's that's the GPS piece, which I'd like to move forward on. I just mm -hmm. wanted to get people's thoughts on that, and the cost is you know, $1,800 for the year, so for the rest of this year. So it's not, not a big number we're talking here. Okay. For that's it. that's for the whole fleet, Tom. That's for the main, not the whole fleet. Right. You can also get separate Seven. GPSs on your heavy equipment, and that actually tracks both hours on the machinery, but also hours on the hydraulics. Oh, wow. So we've thought about that because, you know, we've got, you know, we put thousands of hours on a backhoe pretty quickly, but how many of those are really work hours versus driving? Mm -hmm. um, so, so you, it might be nice to track that so as some point. Uh, part of the maintenance plan. So are yeah. you talking like the dump trucks, the <coughs> all the all the big trucks, yeah. Mm -hmm. Even all the ones just on mobile. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Even the pickups and stuff like that. I mean, we have you know our main fleet is eight. We've got one um, one tandem axle truck. Several you know, couple couple of our pickups are smaller plow trucks that are F three fifties. But but yeah, those are all the daily drivers. Yeah. So I think start there, and, and if it doesn't work, there's no cancellation fee, there's no yeah, installation exactly. fee, it's all part of it. They're assuming that you're going to like it, and you're going to keep up the monthly payments. Great idea. I would also like to endorse the front-facing camera idea as well, because, um, you know, we just had a recent incident with a school bus, mm -hmm. and that front-facing camera came in handy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me get a quote for that too. It, I, I don't remember offhand how much it was, but I recall it's, I think it's at least double per month. So then you're talking 40 a month times eight vehicles. Mm. So you're, you know, you're four grand at that point a year. It's a little, um, mm. but let me, let me the the storage of all that visual. <laughs> Keep you on until next year. Yeah, I don't know about data storage and how that, how that works either. Yeah. Um, where I think I draw the line at is, is um, and Karen mentioned this to me, is that some some of the systems now are front facing with microphones built in, and I don't want to listen in on the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit much. Are you, are you going to mobile to pick up Sam? <laughs> yeah, if we just have one camera and a microphone in mobile, we get it all. <laughs> sandwich, sandwich, sandwich. <laughs> Just these meetings, right? <laughs> <laughs> we got the public the, uh, works crew, we got other towns, we got all that one. The, the accounts payable software, which I think is really awesome, essentially the way it would work is um, vendors can email invoices into a system directly. So there'd be no paper needed. Hmm. Staff go and, and code those invoices from, the, you know, we do the accounting. Yeah. But the software is smart, so once it sees invoices from the vendor a number of times um, you know the things that need to be in our accounts payable system are the vendor name the date the invoice amount the invoice number those basic things um, it's smart software and so it it, it it learns to read those things on the invoice so the first few times you go through it if the vendor name is wrong you highlight it and it remembers it and since invoices from the same companies have the same format you kind of do less and less work over time so the way the system works now is all department heads approve their invoices. Invoices over, I believe, 1,200 also go to me. And then everything goes to the select board. 
that wouldn't change. Um, it would all just be online. So everyone on Selectboard could have a login and you could just click the approve button online or you could disapprove and send it back to us with questions. Um, it's all cloud-based. You can do it from anywhere. You've got an internet connection. That's all great. It's business process improvements, but I think the real value here is we can create a login for John Q Public and they would have access to just the, just the storage side, so just the approved invoices. And so if someone wanted to say, what are we spending our money on? I can say, well, log into the system and, and, and you can see the invoices themselves. Um, so if you think we're spending too much money on a vendor, you can search by the vendor name, you can search by invoice dollar amounts and dates, and you can see the physical invoice and who approved it and when. Um, so it's kind of transparency um, to the nth degree, and you'd see that. The downside to that is citizens micromanaging, you know, because I know when I go look at the invoices, you know, if I see some of these things in terms of like the library, how many books are bought, and yeah. sometimes it drives me a little nuts, but I know <laughs> that's a cost of operating a library. But I could see Joe Q Public, and he sees all these different purchases of books. Mm -hmm. they'll, they'll have a bird. With, so with Mike Bard's <coughs> initials. <laughs> no, I, I I ask Karen. I when I have a question, I ask Karen about it, and usually Karen I, doesn't know. <laughs> she no, 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 no. <laughs> she gets a good answer. Or she refers me to Michelle, or she refers yeah, me mm -hmm. to Tom, and I usually will get the the right answer before signing off. Are you coming in after your rubber as well? Yes, I, I was going to ask Karen if there's going to be a couple sandwiches. <laughs> so I get I guess the question this is you know it's about sixty five hundred a year for the town. You thought about twenty eight hundred would be their share. I want to talk to them about it too. But is this a concept you'd like to explore and do, or is it something that can go in the, that you think should be in the back? If you have no interest, that's fine. If it's something you're interested in, that's we can. Um, can you get a test of the system? Like, kind of, I've used it before. Yeah, other towns use it in Vermont, so I'm, I'm, I'm not worried about it performing. Okay, um, it's a, it's a big company that this is all they do, and they do millions of invoices a day. So, yeah. Do you think it's going to increase your efficiency? <laughs> it will, in the sense that we're a paper factory, and so if I need to get an old invoice, I have to go to Michelle and search it up right. in the files yeah. and figure that out. Now I can do it, and if I'm home, I can do it. Pull it out. Mm -hmm. So that's that's it's helpful from that perspective. The auditors can also see it, and so mm -hmm. they can spend less time here bothering us. And they can mm -hmm. every year that one of the first things they do with standard is they pull a sample of invoices, right, um, and test them for fraud. And so now they can do that on their own. That's where I see the biggest benefit is the audit process. Yeah, having gone through, you know, been part of audits and stuff like that, you know. Quarters like asking every little last question if they have something that they could just look at it's going to really simplify things for them so I think I see that as being a big benefit and so this and the reason I raise it is um, don't have a budget for it so and it's it's not a hundred grand but it, it would be deficit spending and I don't want to yeah, it despite cool. my interest, I'm not going to do that without selected approval. It certainly can wait until next year's budget if that's a desire or just be part of that conversation. Um, I just wanted to present the concept and my thoughts related to it. All right. Can you upload paper invoices as well, or does it require everyone to then send us electronic invoices? Uh, you can. It, so it has to be a PDF, but yeah, you can scan. So we, we created an email <coughs> for it. Vendors can email invoices into it, and we can we get paper here. We can just scan them to that email address automatically. Okay, I got it. Or email so them ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah I'm, I'm more interested in the first one than the second one. I think the second Agreed. one could wait until uh, yeah. next uh, fiscal year. Okay. Uh, town Hall <coughs> card system. Um, this is another one that I'm, I'm highly interested in, but again, it's a pretty substantial price tag. Um, we did have a needle incident a little while back, not not the end of the world. You find needles in public parks in Vermont and any town, these, these things happen. Um, it's been relayed to me since I've started a number of times that someone arrived in the morning and the door was open. 
again, not the end of the world, but it happens. And that door is this one? No, Diff door. different ones. Um, you know, the side door once or twice, the front doors a few times, and part of it is a lot of people use the room, and you know. But I probably left here once at midnight and didn't lock the door and just assumed someone else did. Yeah. Uh, it happens. Um, and then renting the room is also a bit of a challenge because we've got to juggle keys with people. Um, and there's not much stopping them from duplicating that if they wanted to. So with the card access, not card access, but it's a combination system. The cards are more expensive, but we all get a punch code. So if we're going to rent the room, you give that person a code that you create in the online system and you simply set an expiration date and time for that code. So it's all easy and you just email them, your code is one, two, three, four, oh, get in the building on the weekends. Or two, three, four. So it makes it seamless, you know, people can walk out of the building and just, after meetings, and just walk out and not have to worry about the process. And it would be all the external doors uh, mm -hmm. for the building. So the library has a number mm -hmm. of their own and they've got the same challenges. Um, I think it's a worthwhile investment. Um, I think the staff I've talked to about it, um, which I think has been all of them, have all been really enthusiastic, especially Rachel at the library. Um, but again, it's a pretty healthy price tag. I know we've got the local option tax coming in this year, but I don't want to spend $20,000 on something unbudgeted that's not, um, not what I'd call critical need, that it's, you know, we had to spend a lot of money on mud season because people couldn't get to their homes and the school buses couldn't get to it. We just had to do it, unfortunately. This is not quite in that quarter, in that category, but I do feel like it's it's very important to, I think, better secure the building. I do like you put that each like should share the cost. I think that's, you know, we house, we house their, empl yeah. their employees, it's like, I'm surprised that that hasn't come up before. I've kind of shut my mouth about yeah. that. And then once it's installed, it, it's essentially free. Right. Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, what's our appetite for, for this uh, in terms of this year versus next year? <coughs> to rent. Alyssa. For me, staff sentiment weighs heavily, so if staff wants it, I will. I'm just having a reaction to the punch codes right now. I know every Airbnb does it. As someone who doesn't have a key and is often asked if I have a key, and I'm like, no, I definitely don't have a key. Um, so you would, of, you would part, have your own punch code. I know, and part of me is saying that actually is a lower barrier in my case than actually having to get a key. But if if this is the proposed steps, which I'm not, that's just you my, know, I, being honest about my gut reaction is like, oh, a code actually, I mean, it would be easier, so maybe that is what we Yeah, want. I envision punch codes as all staff have punch codes, select board has punch codes, and then. Different individuals have different punch codes? Have your own code, and then I envision it as at least the chairs of, yeah. of the various boards should have a punch code. Um, Maybe the vice chairs, but I mean, you need to get to a meeting. Lady to their meeting. But I think if you're elected to the select board, we, we can trust you with the punch code. Fair. Uh, Karen, I don't know. Are you not me. limited by the number of codes? No. I mean, no, I, I'm, you can, I So therefore, any four digits will get you in. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> what I mean <laughs> is, I, in the private sector, I did have this a system like this, and so each employee was given a code so that management knew who the last person in and out was and various reasons, but we were limited. It wasn't just a limited code. And with all due respect, I have no idea why the entire select board needs a code to get in the building. I, I mean, think that's that, why they didn't all get keys. Is right. because it was kind of questionable why my bar needs to get in the building on a Sunday. Why do you need to get in the building? So, so, so I don't, I'm out fishing. <laughs> <laughs> With that in mind, I do think it would be a huge help for the board chairs to have a code. Yeah. Um, because they typically are going to attend the meeting. What do you need to do on a Sunday in this room? Well, the beauty is we can create temporary code, so right. deal with that. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, I guess if there's no limits, then it's, <coughs> it doesn't matter. But if 100 people have codes, then Bill and Winter is still going to be shaking and his head also, about, who has a key? Also, <laughs> who has a code? And there's also different limits on different entry points mm. so it can be set up that you know we still have physical locks here so you can get in on the weekend you can use the steel room you can use the bathrooms and that's it it's not 
unfettered access to the building. Mm -hmm. is, so is it would be a keypad on the main door and the steel door then? Is a card with an embedded number better than a so code? Cards are expensive. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. I, yeah. I think the technology worked great and I used it 10 years ago. <coughs> You know, um, codes or codes? codes, codes. We had codes, so yeah. um, in that environment, I mean, somebody was fired. Code got deactivated and things yeah. like that. That doesn't happen here, thankfully, but um, it was a great tool for various reasons, and I think it would be great here. I right? just, I'm probably weighing in a little bit about who gets codes. Yeah, I mean, we can talk about that. Sure. Yeah. Do you have an implementation timeline? Like, how long would, is this a quick turnaround once they know, or would it be are um, they scheduling a while out anyway? I think it would be this summer. It would be probably um, by the end of July. So you're looking at doing GPS and town hall card access now and code access. What? <laughs> code. Code. Yeah. code access. Well, Tom is reading from what he says here. Well, no, Push off GPS and and I thought we just discussed. It. No, I thought no, we no, said no, we're going to push off. No, no, we said the GPS is something we want. Yeah, we might go forward with. Yeah, it. and this code thing, but that the uh, new the, system of uh, paperless uh, accounting, uh, something we consider for the twenty five uh, next budget. Well, next year's budget. Everyone went with that. <coughs> have an annoying principled stance that I think we should overspend an equipment line before we commit local option tax money we don't have yet, but I'm not going to say no on that principle. <laughs> I think it's a reasonable use I just feel weird about. I'm so slender. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm not trying to push on this either. I'm just, mm -hmm. it's an option for you to consider. We've got a lot of plans for local option tax. Do you need to vote on this, or you got the solution? I don't. I don't know. Temperature vote. Vote. It, so, it sounds it's like down. everyone is pretty comfortable with the GPS, um, mm -hmm. not with the accounts payable system. And this one, I'm not really quite sure where you're at. So, <laughs> um, do you want to make a separate motion on each one? Yeah, let's do that. I, I, don't, I don't think Tom's asking yeah, you for motions. You, you can just, just give me your, your sentence. I guess, oh, okay. yeah, the town car. First, car. Car. we'll start with the okay. beginning. Okay. Everyone, uh, raise your hand if you're uh, interested in the uh, getting the GPS for the main vehicles this year. Okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, the uh, paperless uh, accounting system. This year? Next, Next year. year. Let's consider. And the uh, code access system this year. <coughs> no. <laughs> Next year. Never. Oh no! <laughs> wow. That's a hard line. Um, no, I support. I just I feel like I don't have enough knowledge to make that decision. I don't know the people that work here. I'm not that familiar with the working conditions here. I've never needed access to this building, so I feel personally like I don't see a benefit to me, and okay. I don't see why I would need it at this point in my time here. But now, how would people like, for instance, like with you know some of these com committee, uh, the subcommittees, not the formal. Commissions and stuff like that, you know, where whatever he works, you know, you know, what people that use the room. steel room, for example, right? The only people that use this room are, are our committees conservation and recreation. Um, the library doesn't even use it, housing task force, natural disaster. But you do rent it, but we rent it, yeah. There's right. just a blood drive here. So I think Tom's suggestion is that those rental individuals would be given a temporary key code mm -hmm. to, to get access on Which that one time. Which would be like a one day thing and then it would yeah. just expire. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I do piggyback that there's been some issues that we'll see now lockup procedures are posted not only on the pegboard mm -hmm. but on the door. So when I was going over that with an individual last week, I was able to not only show her how to do it but then remind, you know, there's a check spot, there's a, <laughs> roadmap here for you to follow, which I think gave her a lot of comfort. Um, so, I don't know, no one's asking me my opinion, I'm not raising my hand. 
No, I think Karen? <laughs> I, I would wait till 2025 and budget for it. I think I think we could get by the rest of the year using the method we have. I but I do think there's a value in, in updating that technology. Yeah, yeah, that's well said. I agree with that. I think let's figure it out before we go and spend a bunch of money and then maybe really want to change it around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So GPS this year, mm -hmm. everything else next year. That's my mm -hmm. sentiment. Well, look at it. Oh, I don't think they guarantee. We can look at look at everything pretty much for free. It's a budget. It's a budget. It can be in the dress budget. Ooh, dress budget. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Everyone good with that? Yeah. Yeah. My on. only other, I assume we can't get just the front door. I feel like to me the most compelling is if, if you could get just this steel room and keep everything else locked. Soon, to me, there's like a. Yeah. But I assume it's a one-time install, and they want to do all the doors. Yeah, there. that to me is the more. Of, we don't want people to have access to the main office. Yeah. that's what I'm most concerned about for security wise. You right. know, I don't. Well, what could they do here? The worst thing they could do is probably graffiti or something like that, or you know, you know, there's all sorts of mysteries. Now it's pretty total watching over the room. <laughs> okay. Yeah, they're not getting in the vault, so. Yeah, uh, they're not getting in the vault. Next. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just right. liked your confidence. <laughs> that's what he said. No, that door is. Uh, that door is. Do we have a post generator? Uh, flip. Um, yeah. I did have a drop. Yes. I like right. the room. Oh, yeah, it's in there. there. It's front to back. Oh, front to so back. Oh, okay. There, there we go. go. Perfect. <laughs> Got it. So, uh, proposed for next meeting is the um, usual bylaw update. The bylaw update. From um, 7 15 to 10. Oh. Oh. Are we... <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Fair. Oh, that's what it says. Five years in the making. Um, okay, well, we'll, we'll change the uh, times here. Yeah, we'll add um, time. So I'll... Might I suggest um, mm -hmm. while the Planning Commission will be here at the next meeting? So they tonight, I don't know the outcome of it tonight, but they are they are talking about phase two and, and what do they do? And my understanding from talking to Neil was there was um, there was some push where phase two um, is going to be the entire rest of the town. And, and I expressed to Neil and I told him, feel free to tell this to the planning commission, but in two years, we're gonna be working on our town plan. And so I think it might be a good conversation between the select board and the planning commission to maybe think about, do you simply just spend the next X number of years working on bylaws updates for the whole town? Or do you maybe try to accomplish something in just this two year window and, and think about the art of the possible? Because then you're going to be focused on the town plan for a while, um, or do you do the town plan now? Because um, you don't need to do it every you have to do it every ten years, but you can do it shorter, and then focus on bylaws. And I said to Neil, um, I don't I don't particularly care from my perspective how they want to do it, but I think the board should be aligned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that'd be a good conversation to have. And I know the Planning Commission was having some of that conversation tonight. Cool. All right, well, we can uh, <coughs> get, uh, and then there's the bylaw that we suggested that they revise. Uh, and uh, they're gonna be coming back to us with that. Yeah, they should have that all wrapped up. So this could be, this could be the wrapped up discussion could it not okay. wrapped up discussion yeah, and just yeah. a conversation about what the next phase is okay um and then setting the tax rate <laughs> so we don't quite have a final grand list as of today um there's always some minor grievances um, and those are settled by the listers um, and usually it's small matters you know a few grand here a few grand there um There could be one reasonable size grievance um, for a business that did a pretty major expansion. We haven't heard anything yet, but just that's the one that would make sense because there's a big value change for that business. They did also a huge expansion. Um, but as it stands now, based on the grand list, um, we're in a good place. Um, grand list grew more than 
expected, which is good. So it looks like we will have, um, if the tax rate is the same rate adopted on Town Meeting Day, we'll have a surplus, probably 30,000, a bit more, um, which will give you the option of actually setting a lower tax rate if you desire than the one adopted at Town Meeting Day. Not dramatically lower, we're talking the third decimal place, but mm -hmm. and then there's something to consider. Taxes. And there's school taxes, which are something. Well, <laughs> yes, higher in the second decimal place. 15% <laughs> at least? <coughs> it's not both. Uh, all right, so you want to keep that on? Do you want to have I that think, I think we'll be ready. Okay, all right. So, yeah, sorry, just to. And if we're not, we'll know. Yeah, he's doing his grievance hearings on the 19th. So maybe we do want to postpone July. Well, we'll know in the sense that um, if any of the grievances are large, if they're small, we can we can still make assumptions. Even if everyone was settled for the requested amount, we still should have a good margin. Okay. And the parking rates. So. I made about nine motions for things to continue, including but not limited to our dear friend, the local hazard mitigation plan. And I'm looking uh, back to see what <laughs> maybe 20 minutes. We have to vote on our most favorite mitigation strategies. Mm -hmm. Ideally, it can be shorter if we prep ahead of time. We can, we can feel free to uh, send you our favorites. Yeah, we what? could. I was gonna say, had I known, we could have like dot voted. It would have. Been I thought that was. I thought he was encoded by until July fifteenth. This is <coughs> He's, the, You're right. So we could do it that or July first. We just have to get it to him. He wanted two weeks. So if oh. we do a July one, we gotta get it to him. Yeah, I think we should have uh, at least a preliminary discussion on this to keep it uh, keep it moving. Yeah. Okay. I mean, so I feel like we learn and just do tallies. Yeah, it might be like more okay. time. Um, and then. The other one was housing trust update. Yeah, yeah. that one your motion sent July first. Mm -hmm. All right. And noise <coughs> ordinance. And uh, noise. Yeah. Oh. Um, noise. I think she said too. Let's have a party and test out the visible machine. <laughs> it can just be a secondary. We're now noting, but we can have multiple agreement. discussions. Uh, I'm looking here at our parking lot. Meeting. Um, the the three year budget plan, which oh, is really about, what I was looking at. <laughs> which is really about capital, that's ready to be presented at the next meeting or right. some future meeting desired. Okay. Um, I guess two things that I'm looking at in the parking lot. The first one is leave people traffic because oh my god did I get lit up last keeper season on Belfort Road. I got. 16 phone calls in a day mm -hmm. uh -huh. about Gopdol and 100 and Perry Hill being back. <coughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it's ways, ways so that, that we should go that way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe before the leaves turn brown, we should probably talk about it. We just turned green. Mm -hmm. uh, we only have three months till we turn orange. <laughs> Second <laughs> July meeting? <laughs> uh, well, I'm just spitballing, and then the change to town meeting format, we should probably do sooner rather than later, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been on. <coughs> the other I was going to yeah. propose adding to the parking lot is police stats. Yeah. When we get them, mm -hmm. and evaluation criteria for policing. I feel like it came up indirectly today, but is it just the stats? Is there other things we're considering for like those who can park? Sure. We also could do a farmer's market debrief, because I'm sure you'll have tons to tell us, Roger. Okay. Great. <laughs> Sweet. Five minutes? <laughs> yeah. Decide what questions work yes, or not. Yeah, choose which ones I prefer to I listen to. <laughs> the others that I didn't. Um, but yeah, okay. We can add that too. All right. Any other suggestions? Are you inviting um, Dan Schneider from the Bogota Cider Mill to have a discussion about leaf paper traffic? Uh, I don't know if he needs to come here. Uh, I'll reach out to him just personally and see if he's planning uh, to, uh, to uh, have traffic control on weekends uh, during the uh, key foliage weekends. 
If not, then you'll get invited. <coughs> and you wanted to do that next week, the seventh week? Sure. Yeah, I mean, if if we were trying to stuff some more fun discussions into the agenda for next week or next, two weeks from now, then sure. But I do think before peeper season is upon yeah. us, it is a discussion we should have. Okay, I'll, we'll see. I guess how the how it all comes together. Okay. Yeah. We can. Uh, I can come meet with you on Friday. Uh, we'll set the preliminary agenda and then see how things shut off uh, uh, Friday after that. There are very few agenda items I vouch for that are as less hotly contested yeah. as people traffic. <laughs> mm -hmm. So you said strategically. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Policing people. Incidentally, I don't know how many of you know this, but the fellow at Good Stuff pulled his entertainment permit when he learned the terms. So Really? Yeah. What were the terms? The terms was they was provided <coughs> authorization for one yeah. to see how it went. Oh. And so he, when I gave him that information, he <coughs> pulled his permit and well, asked me to shred his check. Well, so he not did finished. want them all under one, right, originally? Yeah, he wanted them all under one permit. It wasn't, it wasn't about the cost. Tom, Tom's suggestion at the meeting was $25 per occurrence. That wasn't the problem. It was. We want to see how it goes. Yeah, he, he wanted just, to get a bureaucracy. He felt like it was too and much trouble for him to organize it without without the continued authorization to do so. I guess so. It was a respectful email, but he just yeah. said, "Forget it." And then I've got one more item. I think I'll have it ready for the seventeenth. Um, not one hundred percent sure. But I'd just like to get it on the radar now. It's um, like to talk about a bump out. Um, for Stone's Throw Pizza. Can't you oh, what? A bump out. A bump out. Oh, a bump out. I thought it was a bump out. For, to allow for outdoor seating. Bump out. Uh, the really popular people. For what? Really um, to allow for outdoor seating. Do you mean like uh, on temporary Stone's ones, like Montpelier or mm -hmm. Temporary. Okay. So I'm going to have like In not annoying way, bump out, I think of as permanent. I think they're, what are they called? Montpelier? On them. Parklet? Gazebos. So you lose parking. Yeah, right in the road there. So you yeah. can't yeah. lose yeah. a couple yeah. spaces yeah. for sure. Yeah, well, they weren't They weren't supposed to be permanent. They were permanent when they were pitched. <coughs> and then they just. Um, that's yeah. a good question. Uh, there's a group of uh, residents that use that back parking lot for their social circle. Uh, but I don't know. No, wouldn't the bump out be in the front? Yeah, no, I think that's what you're talking about. But, uh, quietly, that's why they can't use their own. Cell phone corner, and if they couldn't just use the back area where they used to do the like, pickup, but uh, again, it's sort of like the uh, sure. pizza pickup on the back side. Mm -hmm. We could have uh, outdoor seating out there. We could ask them that. I think it's probably because they want more parking. Visual. More yeah. visual, yeah. right? Uh, right. Uh, Magnetism there. If, um, if, but then, you know, if no one's been, been speaking in that area, if no one's been down to the Stowe Street Alley, you should take one. Mm -hmm. I'm really yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, pretty, it's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. look for the Dallas Peak Clap brick. <laughs> well, Carla and Bill and we're both really, uh, I don't know who got the brick for them. But yeah, I saw their brick. I was surprised not to see Steve Lotchby. He's on there. It's He's on that break. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I got it. I didn't see Steve. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't really tell them I was reading this on the window. But yeah, because yeah. they were the like municipal staff when I moved to town. Yeah. yeah. I'm glad they found him. Yeah, they were. Uh, Woody sent them a picture. Yeah. 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 All right, you're doing an executive session? Sorry, I'm taking it off. That's all right. Yeah, it's a, it's a false um, uh, do we need an executive session? Yeah, we should give it a quick. All right. All right. Oh, all right. I'll take a motion. <coughs> Before real estate oh. um, transaction. I move to find that pending premature knowledge, premature public knowledge of pending real estate will clearly transact. Real Premature public knowledge of pending real estate transactions will clearly place the town of Waterway at a substantial disadvantage. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. 
Okay. Okay. I just gotta get the camera. I move to enter executive session. 